We now call the Arlington School Committee regular school committee meeting of Thursday, February 14th um, to order. Um, we welcome with us <coughs> Eric Chen, who is in grade 12 and is vice president of the student council, and Eric Lee, who is a senior and treasurer of the student council. So thank you both for coming. Um, and we also welcome Ms. Hansen, who is uh, union leader of the AEA. And Ms. Chen, Ms. Uh, Dr. Tessin will be joining us later. Yes. And that pretty much gets us to everyone. And now we have new art to admire. This art is coming to us via the Stratton School um, with Mr. Hanna and Ms. Donovan as principals of the Stratton and the, I'm sorry, it's the Stratton School and is hosting the Thompson. Some of these are Thompson students art. Um, and Dr. Ms. Donovan is the Thompson principal. Uh, the art teacher is Deborah Companion. And we start with the kindergarten snowmen who are over there. Kindergarten students read the book Snowmen at Night, written by Carolyn Booner and illustrated by Mark Booner. This, in, this story, in this book, snowmen come alive and have all kinds of fun on a wintry night. After reading the book, students were encouraged to, th encouraged to think of the many things snowmen might do and then create mixed media pictures um, to illustrate those. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, for second grade, they did Mise, Matisse inspired collages. That's over in this corner. Uh, second grade students looked at several of Matisse cutouts. In particular, they studied Icarus from 1947 from the book Jazz. The students noted that the figure Icarus is a simplified <laughs> form floating on a blue background. They talked about the story of Icarus and wondered about the yellow shapes in the cutout. Were they stars or feathers? And then they got to make their own paper cutouts using a similar theme. In third grade, they made imaginary creatures. I think that's, yeah, it's this one. Um, they used their imaginations to create these fantastic creatures. They were given the task of inventing an entirely new animal out of parts of at least three other animals that really exist. They were challenged to think about the characteristics of the animal that made it unique and that could be seen. Um, and then they set about drawing their new creation. And in fifth grade, did I do fourth grade? No, fourth grade got cut off. Um, fourth grade, I think, is along the back wall. They studied abstract art by exploring the art of Wassily Kadinsky. They looked at his paintings and saw how they became more simplified over time, finally focusing on color <coughs> and geometrical shape. They discussed how the colors and shapes brought to mind different images and then drew a design using geometrical and organic shapes in oil pastel and watercolors to finish it. And then in fifth grade, maps, ah, thank you. Um, they made imaginary maps. Students were inspired by maps of places and fictional stories. They looked at maps from A.A. A. Milne's Hundred Acre Wood, J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth, and C.S. Lewis, Narnia. They talked about the different geographical features they noticed and how they were depicted in the maps, and then they drew one of their own, trying to give their drawings a sense of geographic logic so they appear to be real places with mountain chains, rivers, cities, towns, and beaches. So it's a wonderful set of art and brings us for a colorful Valentine's Day. <coughs> and given our wonderful weather the past weekend and today, I managed to find a quote that has both snow and is appropriate for Valentine's Day. This is from Margaret Atwood, and she writes, or said, the Eskimos had 52 names for snow because it was important to them. There ought to be as many for love. And now we begin. Um, Mr. Jamison, would you like to come to the microphone? The appointed place? Yes. And you get three minutes. And I know that we have a handout from you. Yes. And um, so this relates to uh, a Warren article I filed for the town meeting. It's uh, on the draft warrant. It's number 11, and I apologize for not providing the text of that. Um, basically, it's part of a three-pronged uh, program that I'm hoping to uh, have come to pass in town to consider um, the rules and regulation uh, relating to firearms in particular in relation to, and I thought it was important to put it on the 
warrant this year for consideration. <clears throat> um, and that's sort of described in the first page of the handout. Second page is, um, so as you know, there are various bodies in town that control property. And the only one that has detailed uh, restrictions on the possession or discharge of firearms beyond the overriding townwide um, pro prohibition from discharging a firearm in the town limits is the Park Department. And so the town council and I thought it was a um, good place <coughs> to start for potentially drafting either by law or I'm perfectly open to expanding uh, regulations. And we're, I'm talking to, I talked to the selectmen on Monday, um, cemetery commission yesterday, you uh, today, tonight, and I sensed Kersey something, I thought previously, I don't know if it came through, um, relating to this. Um, and I have to talk to the ARB and the <coughs> Conservation Commission as well. Um, so the, the it's, um, overall aim as far as to have a um, thoughtful discussion of this issue in town. I think it's a relevant issue this year for town meeting. Um, for each of the bodies that control property in town to determine how best to either um, enhance through the enactment of a bylaw amendment to the town bylaws or through regulation their position on that issue. Um, you may find other aspects of the park department's uh, bylaw useful. Uh, and we, um, Mr. Curro on the Board of Selectmen found perhaps the litter aspect would also be useful. So you may find other things that are useful. That's why we provided that. Um, I assume this will be referred to your subcommittee for whatever regulations or don't you have something that I'd policy maybe policy yes and maybe that might be a place to start um, any questions I don't I, guess I'm, I don't know what it is the goal is the objective is to have you look at the restrictions um, existing which I didn't I didn't find any in the bylaws to consider adding bylaw restrictions to in particular to the possession and discharge of firearms on school property beyond legal uses for uh, police and policemen um, or and or to consider implementing uh, additional restrictions to your regulations. I'm sure you have regulations about what can and can't be done on school property so that the regulations on town properties, which is a six different agencies control them, might be more uniform and um, versus the Park Department having strict regulations and no one else that I know of having strict regulations. And you say there's a town? There's a town-wide um, <laughs> pro prohibition for the discharge of a firearm in the town. So part of this is also to work with the chief to publicize what the rules are and what are any rules or regulations or bylaws that you might see put forth as part of this um, ward article to town meeting that were enacted would also be publicized. Uh, as part of that publici publici publicizing of the rules and regulations in the town and the state level that apply obviously to Arlington and also um, through him and in conjunction with the town council to hopefully uh, implement a surrender and destroy program for people who realize that I have a gun, it's not licensed, I don't want to license it, I want to get rid of it and have a method for that. So it's, it's information. Um, making sure that our laws and regulations are coincide with what you all want for each, each authority and providing for um, uh, just surrender if people wish to get rid of guns and ammo they have. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I assume someone will contact me? We have to talk. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and we won't be taking up warrant articles today. Um, no, so. To yeah, I, I thought this would take some time, so I wanted to get things. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, um, at this point, we go on to the Arlington High School Program of Studies. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bodie, did you want to say anything or just? <coughs> we have this evening with us um, Mary Villano, who is the principal of the high school. Every year, the, the, uh, we go through this process of reviewing internally our program of studies both looking at mainly looking at courses that we're going to be uh, be adding to our program of studies and that's again the situation this year um, Ms. Villano has brought these changes to the um, uh, curriculum and accountability subcommittee and had a vetting of this and, and, and 
Jeff, who is the uh, chair of that, may want to talk to the recommended course additions. But I think it would also be helpful to hear actually how <laughs> these courses come about in terms of addition. And I think another thing that's important for, for people who are listening to know is that while we add these courses to the program of studies, the courses we actually run are totally stu student driven. Mm -hmm. And we look for some minimum, minimum enrollments for, the, for those courses to run, but they become options for students. And uh, very often, the courses that are offered usually come from a, an express need, so they usually are courses that do uh, get uh, the enrollment we're looking for. And, and, and Mary may have some more things she might want to add to that, as well as, as, well as the chair of the, the committee, subcommittee. Good evening. I have submitted a um, three-page um, packet with the new courses we're proposing for this year. The full packet for the program of studies is essentially the same, and we've cleaned it up a little bit, did some formatting and editing of course numbers and things like that, but for the most part, there aren't any other significant changes in the program of studies. So um, the first category for changes, we have some new additions for our world language program. And the first one is a two-year course called Latin Language and Culture. And this is being um, proposed to meet the needs of some students who really struggle taking foreign languages. And in the past, um, some of our students who are on a IEPs or who have language-based disabilities struggle with languages. And we've waived the requirement in many cases but more and more schools require two years of a foreign language for admittance. So it's really important that we provide something for students who really um, find foreign languages difficult. So this is a two-year course. It's basically a full-year Latin course at a slower pace. So students will be able to um, take the class for two years. It'll count as a two-year um, credit for Arlington High's graduation requirement, and it'll also meet the two-year requirement for college admissions. And basically, um, it's, it's a Latin one course, just offered at a slower pace, including um, Latin culture as well. So it's listed as uh, culture A and culture B. The first course will be offered this year. The second one will be part two, which would kick in the following year. The next option is Italian One. Catherine Ritz, our World Language Director, was able to um, acquire a grant that is going to fund a one-section Italian course. And um, if we have enough enrollment and the interest is there, we'll be able to reapply the following year. And it's a renewable grant as long as the grant's being offered. So there's some um, potential for expanding it after this, this coming year. And we have a part-time teacher on staff already who can teach it, so we don't even have to go out and find a person who will teach one class of Italian. So everything fell into place nicely for that course. The last language course is Mandarin 4. As you know, we've had um, <coughs> the Mandarin grant for the last few years, and we've been slowly building that program. And now we're able to offer Mandarin 4 for the students that have been in that class for the last three years. It's a small number, so those students will be merged with Mandarin 3. The first year we offered Mandarin, there were um, many juniors and seniors that took the class, so they're gone now. But we are slowly building a base of students that are um, starting with grade 9 and, and continuing on. So it looks um, very hopeful that our Mandarin program is going to be solid and will grow continuously. So it's um, great that we can offer Mandarin 4 at this point. The next category is math, and Matt Coleman, our math director, has um, started doing some reorganization of our math courses and um, is really looking at a grade 6 to 12 continuum. And this year he's offering, uh, he's replacing actually math applications, which is a senior course um, that students would take if they were not up to taking statistics or, or calculus. And it's called quantitative reasoning. It's being offered at curriculum A and curriculum B levels. And there's just a, a change in the basic curriculum of the math applications course, so it's more relevant and more suitable for what they may need as they move on to um, college after high school. 
And the last course is a course that we've had in the past. It has not run in the last few years, but uh, Matt is hoping to get it back running at the high school, and that's AP Statistics. Next category is Visual Arts. We've had a very um, popular ceramics program for many years. The teacher that has been teaching this class is really um, suffering from su significant health issues with her, her hand and her shoulders, making it very difficult for her to continue working with the equipment um, in ceramics. Um, so unfortunately, we have to phase that out or replace it with two other courses. One is painting, and one is mixed media and sculpture. The good news about the mixed media course is that um, it's going to be able to use a lot of equipment that we have um, available already that we've either uh, used in our ceramics course or we've had in other courses in the past. So we'll be able to make use of a lot of things that we have um, in our stock room. And the final course in Family Consumer Sciences is Bake Shop Science. That's, that is a course we had in the past, um, and it was eliminated during one of our budget cut years. And it's a baking course, but it really focuses a lot on the chemistry of baking and has a lot of science concepts built into the curriculum. So um, it's a hands-on, fun course, but really talking about the science behind baking. And that's it for the, the new courses that we're proposing. Mr. Thielman. So our, our subcommittee met on uh, Monday, February 4th, uh, Paul, Bill, and I, and we approved this unanimously. Uh, the, it's, it's revenue neutral, and it's uh, needed additional programming and courses for the high school. So we recommend it. So I, I move approval of the changes to the AHS course of studies as described by the principal. Second. Okay. Does anyone else want to speak to the motion or to ask questions? Ms. Mikhail. Um, I just would like to thank um, the curriculum, and I'm not going to say your whole name, subcommittee and the staff at the high school for reintroducing um, some of our more rigorous classes, such as AP statistics and, and um, the upper level Mandarin. Um, it's nice to know that our students that want to push themselves will have more opportunities to do so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone yes, else? Um, I had a couple of questions. I wonder if the Latin, given our recent problems with the MIA, does the new Latin course, would that fulfill their guidelines for, thing, for sorry, credit? I had trouble hearing you. Would the new Latin course fulfill the MIA guidelines uh, for, is it substantive enough? MIAA? The oh, athletics. You mean NCAA? That was NCAA. It was NCAA, it's true. It's NCAA. Okay. They stick um, the yeah. nose into high school. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's um, a curriculum A level course, so yes, it will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, I'm not sure. Yeah. CAA got involved. There were some high schools that were not requiring rigid courses and made students ineligible when they got to the college right. level. Right. I'm, I'm talking about the Massachusetts one. The, their only the, their only concern is whether they pass courses or not. not okay. Not, not, the, not, the, not the level. Okay. The but course. anyway, that, so it would. So that's yes, not an issue. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that's just because we don't want to have things right. where we're shunting people into, and then we have. Um, and you had also mentioned on on the sheet here that there's physics, which will now be open to qualified tenth graders. It, yes, I, I think I skipped over that one. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, that's been offered for juniors and seniors, um, but there has been some concern about students taking lots of AP courses during junior and senior year. And so Larry Weathers, director of science, thought that for a small number, this is really a very small number of students that would qualify for this, who have a strong interest in science, if they took this as an elective their sophomore year, providing that they have the skills they need to take the course at that time. Um, they could take it as a sophomore, and it would take it would reduce the number of AP classes that they would take junior or senior year. Okay. So it's trying to spread it out a little bit. But for the most for most students, um, this would not um, be an opportunity for them. Okay, Mr. Hainer. Just to follow up on that, mm -hmm. does the school have a policy? Do we have a policy on on the amount of AP courses a student can have during their uh, high school? 
Korea. We do not have a policy at this time. We do have a committee uh, that's working right now consisting of parents, students, and uh, staff at the high school to talk about the overall concerns around kids taking too many AP courses and stress. So we've met a couple times, and we're not sure if we'll come out with a recommendation or what the result will be, but it's something worth talking about. Thank you. Okay. And then I had one other comment, which was that I've heard um, since the agenda was posted from several parents who were very distressed to hear that ceramics was being dropped um, as a course. I understand what you're saying, that the teacher can't teach it, but it's something that they felt is something that's kind of a basic foundation of a fine arts type of approach. And um, I've asked them to communicate their concerns to the rest of the committee. I don't think that's happened yet, but hopefully it's coming soon. But Mr. Hainer. Well, I asked a similar question, uh, if it would have any effect on students deciding to go forward in an arts program on a college level. And the, what was the answer that I got was the program, the courses that are now being offered in place of this are the more current courses that the universities, the art universities, are looking for. Ceramics is something, I don't mean to minimize it, but the newer courses are the better courses that the universities are looking for. So they, okay. parents I'm, have that I'm concern communicating too. what I heard from these parents, and they were significantly concerned. And I was getting lots of notes, and I was trying to you know, right. send your notes to everybody, but it hasn't happened yet. Mr. Schluckman. Yeah, I just just to reiterate, the uh, we were told that the uh, art schools are looking upon the ceramics courses as more as a craft-based uh, uh, item than than a fine arts, and that. Certain elements of ceramics will be incorporated into one of the new courses. Yeah. So, uh, you, actually, what we're doing is raising the bar and including that uh, portion of that in a curriculum of a of a, of a stronger course. So, uh, I, I had that concern when I heard about it, and the discussion in subcommittee uh, made it appear, at least to me, that what we're doing is we're improving our course offering. Okay. Again, I'm communicating what I heard. And I think there is still concern about that, but mm -hmm. I'll ask them to, Mr. Th Pierce. Will, will there be any, any new hires? I know Mr. Thielman said revenue neutral, but are, will there be any? With this plan, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, there's a small number of students taking mm -hmm. Mandarin. I think sometimes students might move from one class to another, mm -hmm. but in the end, you know, it's, it's, it's an even swap. Um, like this, the math classes are replacing other math classes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't foresee that we're going to need to add staff for any of these, no. The Mandarin class will be merged in with a Mandarin 3. Mm -hmm. Is it always a one-to-one -one -one swap, like in terms Not of? Not always. But what happens is if, if, if we had 25 students taking Italian, mm -hmm. that probably means one less section in some other language, possibly. Um, so what we do is we look at our numbers and we base our staffing on that so another language could drop a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we really look at the numbers of kids overall when we, when we staff positions. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, one last question. And the kids do, when, when, when are, when's the due date for everyone to, to select? When? Well, we're just starting that process now. Yeah. Um, during the month of March. Uh -huh. A majority of the students will be selecting courses, and we'll start looking at numbers in April. Okay. And that's when we start deciding how many teachers we need for every subject. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Bunny? Uh, there might be a little confusion when we look at the budget later, because we have uh, money set aside for Mandarin mm -hmm. uh, Chinese. The situation is that, that we have been able to staff some, some of our Mandarin sections with uh, a teacher from from China provided through a grant from the State Department so we actually have someone who probably will return who's th that that person's money is already in the budget but we are going to have to supplant the person who came through the State Department grant and add another point two to be able to do the the other section so it's re what the budget is reflecting is the money we need 
uh, and but the actual people may be a little bit less than than that if that makes sense mm -hmm. okay but we um, will be hiring I'm sorry we will be hiring a, the, an additional point two for Italian <coughs> I had just one other question I'll call the question um, for the Italian do does two years of two different languages count as the to fulfill the two-year language requirement we've actually um, want to change that to two years of the same language for the same reason for college um, admissions in the past we've had um, students taking one language one year and a different language another year and that's been acceptable but now where uh, colleges are looking for two years of the same language we're going to ask students to take to choose one language and, and do two years of that Okay, I'm just wondering if anyone starts Italian and then you're not able to do year two of Italian, is that sending them down a... Well, for students coming in as freshmen, we will be talking to them about really thinking about the language they want. If, if someone started a language this year and they weren't <coughs> pleased with it, they can start again with another language and take two years after that. I mean, well, they'd really have to think about the college they're applying to and see what their asking them to take. That's the key, where they want to go to school. Okay, Dr. Ben. The grant is renewable and expandable. So uh, the first year will uh, fund a point two, mm -hmm. and when that program grows, it will fund a point four. Okay. okay. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. And now we move on to central registration plan. All right. Well, as last year, as we, we entered in the process of uh, redistricting, one of the changes that we needed to make within the district was how we um, handled registration for elementary students. At the moment, nothing has changed for registration of students at, at the secondary level. But because um, we have a new policy on redistricting, in, which involves buffer zones, this is not something that can continue to really, uh, registration can continue to be at the school level because there is no mechanism or, or ease of way of, of handling uh, a student that might be might move into or lives in a, in a particular buffer zone. So we have been working on developing a process. And I want to give a lot of credit to Leilani D'Agostino, who is here this evening to present um, what we're doing with central registration, and also to Adam Kurowski, who um, has been the architect of the software that will be behind the um, the registration process online and it has taken a lot of time to do this it's, it's extremely detailed work uh, to make sure that all of the links and the drop downs all work the we have sent a letter today to ki to all prospective kindergarten families telling them of the new process and uh, how to go to the to the website so tomorrow we will turn turn it on and it will be live but uh, um, Leilani is here tonight who is our she has a very long title but we're also adding a central registrar I think that might be the part of it but she is um, the person who is our director of curriculum our data and uh, curriculum integration so I'm going to turn this over to Leilani and we're happy to have any questions at, at the end of this. You're not going to see the live, but what you are going to see are slides of, of um, pages that would come up in central registration. So I'm always excited to talk to school committee. I haven't been here for a while, but some of you know how excited I get when I come. He's like smiling. He's like, yes, I know. Um, <laughs> Because when I come to school committee, it's because I'm always presenting something new. So Dr. Bodie never wants me to be bored, I don't think. She always brings out these really interesting projects for me. So this is one of the most interesting projects she's brought before me because it's data in a different way. So um, you are all familiar because you created it, the district goal. And your district goal was very clear that I'm supposed to 
develop a centralized registration process for all new students that incorporates school committee approved redistricting guidelines and is widely communicated to all stakeholders. That's good. I, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what to do with that information necessarily. So when I met with uh, Dr. Bodie, she said, okay, we'll break it down for you. We'll make it really easy. I would like you to create a central <coughs> location to register children. I would like you to create a uh, central and streamlined process, nice and streamlined. And we'd like to make sure we're communicating to all the parents, to all the principals, to all the secretaries, to all the teachers, to all the parents, children, administration, upper administration, just about everyone I could possibly find in Arlington. So that's a kind of tall order, but I like that. Um, and we want to make sure that at the end of this, you can verify what is being done. So I said, okay, I like that. And the easiest part of it was to figure out where to do it because I have the most beautiful office in the town of Arlington. So this is where you come to centrally register your children in my beautiful office in the media center if anyone would like to stop by. And I even have a Keurig machine. So if you do come by, we can, we can have a cup of coffee. Um, but seriously, on a serious note, the task is to look at seven different elementary schools to figure out what each one is doing and to find a way to make sure we're touching all those schools and all the incoming children, not just kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. And when I looked at the seven elementary schools, I realized that the end goal is the same, children in classrooms. But the way each school did it was very different and I, I congratulate all seven of our elementary schools because they they do an excellent job. They bring those kids in and they bring the parents in and they do a great job, but it's different enough that it's not centralized. So I had to step back from the project and just stand there for a minute. And that little person on the screen, that's me. And you'll see me throughout this presentation. And um, that little person represents change. Uh, you all know Dr. Bodie likes things to be progressive. So when we began this process last year, it wasn't just to do it and finish it, it was to do it and to, to make it up to the minute, make sure it's always streamlined. So you'll see where we started and where we're about to go with kindergarten registration, which will then filter right into central registration. So today, for example, I was doing central registration, knowing that in two weeks I'll be doing kindergarten registration, knowing that I'll be doing central registration after that. So they all work together. So, I want to communicate to the parents and we began the process with come on in and sit down with me and fill out some paperwork and so people were dropping by all the time anytime I don't I, I couldn't leave my office so we decided that wasn't really that wasn't really gonna work and so then we decided let's put it up on the web so now I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of what it looks like if you were a parent and none of you have come for central registration I would remember you so hopefully this is gonna be new to all of you all of you a little bit we begin with a uh, request from a parent usually that says, my name is John Doe and my son is gonna be coming to the school, could you tell me what I need to do? And so I was sending these nice little emails out to people and it kind of uh, highlighted what the forms were that they needed to find. And at this point, you don't have to read what's up there, but at this point it was saying, if you go onto the website and you click on the parent form section, you can find all these great forms. Let's download them, let's fill them in, and bring them in to see me. Um, not sure that's too realistic. So we thought about it and we said, well, we can't get them onto the website and then get them over to a central parent form place. We need to have a registration place. And so we have created this great spot called registration. <laughs> and and um, it's all right there for you. And the parent clicks on the, on the form, prints out the PDF, fills it in with a pay, pen, brings it in to see me, and the, and the process moves on. Now, I just made a little mistake. I don't usually like to go back, but I wanna go back. Cause you see me in the corner? Anytime you see me, that means I'm gonna make a change. So this is what we started with, this very simple process. And now starting tomorrow morning, Dr. Bodhi at 8 a.m., our new website will be up there. And when a parent goes on to registration now, they can select kindergarten, they can select elementary, or they can select middle and high school. Kindergarten and elementary are pretty much the same. This is all talking about where to call if you need some help, give me a call, I can help you walk you through it. Right here where it says click here to access, tomorrow that'll be a link 
which you will click on, which will bring you directly to the forms we want you to fill out. So if you remember my previous slide, I'm listing all these different forms. And I'm asking you to fill out each of these things. Now you're going to click a button and type your answers. And that's, that's Adam's thing. And that's fabulous. What he did is just amazing. It's, it's, it's seven pages. So we condense everything down to seven pages. In addition to doing that, we are going to ask parents to bring us some information. I want to see your driver's license. I need to see two forms of proof of residency. We'd like to see your child's birth certificate. So we're going to be taking some back, too. Originally, when the parent came to sit with me and they brought all this stuff in, we had this nice little checklist and I could check off what they brought in. And I could let them know that they had to bring in their health stuff. And, you know, that was working well. And we let them know what school they'd be going to. Now, with the redistricting, we can't release that information necessarily right off the top. And the health, the nurses were saying, well, if you're going to collect all this other stuff, you might as well collect the nursing stuff. And we agreed. I, I think that sounds fair. Um, but remember, there's a little picture of me down here. So we found a way to make this even more streamlined and a little more efficient. So now you have a real checklist at the beginning, not when you're sitting in my office. When you're at home in your house and you're running your program, you can check off that you have all these things. If you want to write some notes about some questions you might have when you're sitting in registration, you can go ahead and do that there. So we just tried to streamline it just a little bit. I don't know how effective this is because we haven't used it yet, but I will let you know after the third week in March because that's when we'll be done with kindergarten registration. And we are hoping that all 400 and something families comes to see us in, the, in those days. So then we want to move on. That's what I do for the, for the parent. What happens when the parent walks out of my office and I'm holding all this paperwork? I've got to get it to the schools. And I have to get it to the schools pretty quickly because most children are very excited to begin their career in the Arlington Public Schools. And they're there, and they want to go. So we usually end their meeting with me by making a phone call to the school and letting them know <coughs> a child's sitting here with their parent. They're going to come over to the school. Is that OK? And the school says, oh, yes, we'd love to have you. In the time it takes the parent to leave my office and go to a school, I take this information and I send it directly to the principal online. So when the child walks through the door, the information's already there. On a really good day, I get the child into power school. So when the parent comes through the door, the child comes right up in power school and they can place the child in a classroom. So we are using the computer to speak. We're speaking together on the phone. And of course, we send everything into office as well. We want hard copies of everything at this point until it runs a little further. When I'm sending things online, I want to make sure the principal's alerted that I'm sending something. So everything's written in capital letters, which I know you're not supposed to do. But I'm not screaming at anyone. I'm just excited. And I'm letting them know it says in central registration, all in capital letters, lets them know, please read this email immediately, because chances are there's a child coming to your school, just in case you didn't hear my phone call. It lets them know what we've done. I've put the child in the computer. I've put the child in power school. There I am in the corner, so there's something about this form that we didn't like. And what we didn't like was what happens if the parent forgets something? The school wants to know that. They don't want to have to go through 14 pages of data to figure out that the birth certificate was missing. So we have a second letter. And the second letter reads just like the first letter, except it says, oh, wait, this is missing. And it's pretty clear that I've accepted the paperwork, but the child may not begin classes until whatever is missing is filled in. So that seems to be working. I think we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the principals about this. So this is something where I don't have a little person on the bottom of the screen because it seems to be working. I don't have to change that particular form. So I finished with the, with the parents, and I finished with the principals. And now it goes on to that verification part, which is, which is what's very important to us because that's what makes my numbers become real. And. Um, I don't know who this really represents. That might actually be me. I'm just so happy when they finish. But I'm going to say it's the child. Um, again, something that looks familiar to you is, is that original form. We checked off the things to let everybody know that I received these things, what they're going to need to bring, and what school they're going to go to. We've changed this up a little bit. And that this, when they come for kindergarten registration especially, we'll now be signing off 
and dating it. I think the date is important for well, let me, something. I could talk a little bit more okay. about that. But the date, so remember this little date right here because this is an important piece right there. Um, this is their, their receipt that they've come, that they've turned everything in. This is what central registration and kindergarten registration looked to me like last year. If you were to ask me to describe to you what it was like, it was this yeah. army of people with these pencils and pens because they didn't do stuff or they sort of did stuff or they maybe did stuff and they just came in and they had to sit for a long time. We've thought about it, we've talked about it. I met with Adam several times. Um, when the parent walks through the door now for kindergarten registration, they will be greeted by someone. If their packet is incomplete, they will immediately go to a computer lab and finish their forms. If they have completed their forms but have forgotten to print something, they will go to another area in which we will help them print. If they have brought their birth certificate but forgot to Xerox it, they'll go to a different area and they'll get their Xeroxing done. And if they have come with everything done, they'll come to me. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little smarter about it. <laughs> they'll come to me. So I went from this chaos of little army men with pens to this nice streamlined process. Um, the only thing that they have to use paper and pencil for right now is the health form if they feel more comfortable printing it for confidentiality purposes. They have the choice to do it online or to print it. The only other piece of paper that they have to print and fill in is our home language survey. Um, and that's because it's new, because the state had mandates on it. Then they do the rest of it on the computer, and then they're done. It's as simple as that. So our process is, is pretty, it is pretty streamlined. It is pretty, pretty easy. Um, I'm trying to make my presentation as streamlined as the process. I could never be the director of data and not end my presentation with some numbers, right? I mean, that would just frighten you all if I did that. So I do have some numbers here. I apologize. The piece of paper in your packet has uh, uh, an addition error on it, but I have repri I know. Can you even believe that? <laughs> like, I'm shocked. I know. I, I was shocked, too. You know, and I got it up here too late. The packet, packets were printed. But I have found the error. We have fixed it. We forgot to, to hit some. We hit but not the word some. So I have fixed it for you. You will notice, though, that August was a very popular month for central registration. And that um, even January, we've had 17 new students in grades K to 5 for the month of January. We're totaling about 110 <coughs> kids. This, these numbers show us that it is a good idea to have a central place to go to. So um, I think my time is up. I promised Dr. Bodhi I would go through this very streamlined and quickly. And so I, I am finished with mine, and if you have any questions or anything. Well, we're just going to add a couple more things, and then more questions. Um, when, we, when, a, when a parent goes on the, the, the software, they're going to type in their address. In fact, you, you do buy a drop-down menu, and you do a drop-down menu for the, uh, the number of the house as well. And what will come up is an automatic fill-in of what your district is, whether it's Stratton or it's going to be a Hardy-Thompson uh, buffer zone. And then you will have the opportunity to say what your preferred school is and that whether you want to be on a wait list. What the, what the parents have been told is that the wait list will be determined by data registration. And if there's more than one application on a particular day, then it's all by lottery within that that particular day. So I think that um, we, in doing this and, and having this particular incentive, I think that we're going to see a very heavy first week. We have set up five nights for kindergarten registration. All, all of this now is going to be in the late afternoon evening from 4.30 to 7.30 at the high school. Um, they really have worked really hard in getting a very um, streamlined process going on. So it should go very smoothly and it will go very fast for any, any family that comes in with everything filled out because you'll just go right through the, the centers and move forward. But I think that to the committee, you wanted to know a report back in the fall as to how many, uh, by, by each one of the, the districts, how many, uh, I should say the buffer areas, how many had their first choice um, and how many came off the wait list and, and how that all looks. And with the software that Adam has developed, all of that data will um, be possible. The other nice thing about the software that Adam has created, this, it's very important to us, but it, it's, not, it's no 
it may not seem like a big thing, but it's really important. All of this is this information will be on the system, and then we're going to be able to download it into PowerSchool. And so we're going to be able to populate right away uh, our data management system, which is going to be terrific. So those are the main other features of this. Okay. Mr. Hainer. What, I don't know if you're directly involved. What if there are legal documents dealing with custodial? Is, is that? Mm -hmm. th that's part of it, too. They, they have to bring in proof of guardianship. Uh, but it, it's also, uh, there's also issues there as well, and we have to have the original, but there are also issues around J-1 visas, but I don't want to, we don't need to talk uh, about that tonight. My, my question with that, when you're sending documents over, this, some of those documents have to be in the school where the child is for, for them to potentially deal with that. Do you, you're not transmitting that. How, how do they get to the school? Um, we, we, put, we put them in a sealed envelope and we send them to your office. We only take the, we, we have them bring the original, but we only keep the copy. I understand that. Yeah. But, I, but it my, all goes. My, my, my concern was the transmission of the document because of the okay, high, high that, sensitivity it, of that document. It does not go scanned. It goes hard copy. Fine. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's fine. Um, thank you, because this is very comprehensive, and um, I work in a district that has a central registration. So in looking at this, um, for the kindergartens, it's very clear, very straightforward. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering for the elementary um, level students, are you making sure that you collect all records from their former school when they centrally register as well? We have a, we have a particular form, and it asks, what was your previous school? And then it lists, may we request your personal record, your behavior record, your MCAS record, your IEP record. They check those off. And then we contact the school, and the school sends us the files. Okay. And, and they, so, they have to sign that, that yes, yeah, so they, we can receive that information. And does <coughs> receipt of that information, um, not necessarily the MCAS, because they're going to get transferred to you anyhow by the state, but um, the attendance, the conduct, and the transcript, are receipt of those dependent before we assign them to their school, or um, can that be pending? It can be pending. Okay. Um, there's only a couple of things that are absolutely necessary before you can actually, and that is your vaccination records, some of your health records. Uh, without that, we can't admit you. Um, I know that it's within our legal rights to require that when the child registers before we give them an assignment. And um, I think it, given the difficulty sometimes there is in getting records after That's the right. fact, um, it might be worth having a conversation about whether that's something you want central registration to look there, at. As there well. are, sometimes that's one of the reasons why we haven't made it absolute because sometimes uh, some schools are not timely in getting us the documentation. But on the other hand, with the permission forms, we're fairly dogged about getting it. Right, and, and as I've learned recently, um, the state does have a complaint system in place for when other sending schools withhold records mm -hmm. and um, I just mm -hmm. I feel that it's very important to a good placement for right. students to have as comprehensive right. information as we can when we, we do when when they when we finish that receipt at the end of their this part here I don't know if you can even read it but it says to complete the registration process and this was the one we used in the summer between now and the beginning of the year you will need to contact your child's school to complete the below and meet your child's principal, and it was specifically for the immunization and the health records. So that was not handled through my office because I wanted a nurse to be looking at it. Mrs. Nicholson and I do have an agreement that if central registration is taking place in my office, I can call her, and if she's on site, she will come to meet the parents. So. That makes sense. And does anyone else have a first question? No, Mr. Hainer. Regarding uh, special education services, if they don't provide, if we don't have the IEP, it, how long before we, I mean, we're not providing services until we do get the IEP, am I correct? And, correct. Okay. Is, is it our responsibility to chase it? It's the parent's responsibility. And I understand that, but I mean. <clears throat> We may, and we even had situations where we have not even known. It, it, it wasn't checked off, so we would know to pursue it. 
Okay. So it's, there's going to be individual situations. On, on that part that you get the release to seek the records, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's, it's legal or not, but just, just a release of all student records. Or do we have to be specific of which records we're looking for? Okay. We don't even need a release. Hmm? Legally, we don't need a release. Once they're a resident, we can contact the school directly. Mm. So what we did do, I should have put a little, I should have put the little one of me on that because we have, a, we have had this come up a couple of times, like Dr. Bodie said, there was a, f a few cases where we weren't aware. So um, when we have a, a specific spot that says, is there an IEP? And if they say yes, from henceforth, the special education department will be notified as well. Um, if a child comes in who's clearly an ELL student, doesn't speak any English, when I'm sending that packet to the principal, I'm always carboning uh, Carla on it. And I think in, in the letter that I sent to the principals, it says um, Carla has been carboned on. Uh, we've included Carla Bruzzese because the child's going to need assistance. So the special education department has requested that as well. So if I'm, if I'm seeing that checked, it'll say um, special education department has been carboned. Right. Um, I wondered how you're letting the elementary students know about the, or and, and middle and high school students, the people moving in, how are they finding out about central registration? Well, it, now when you go right onto the Arlington website, right on the right is a whole thing called school registration. And then currently when you click <coughs> on it, it was, it was the, like the second slide I showed you. But now starting tomorrow, when you click on it, it will stay up at the top, kindergarten, elementary, middle school, high school, and if you, you'll click on the appropriate link. So the elementary would address <coughs> the forms they can do online and they call and make an appointment with me directly. <coughs> middle school and high school, they're directed to Karen Gillis at the middle school and Nancy Cacavaro at the high school. But also, there's some people who will come and not look at the website, yeah. and their tendency is to just call the school that they think that they, they're going to go to, and all of our um, building secretaries I've told them that directs them to Leilani. They <coughs> know both the phone number and email address. In fact, in most of the schools now, I think they have a sheet of paper they just give parents, or they certainly give it over the phone, and uh, they call and make an appointment. So there's a, 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 both an oral way through the schools as well as the website. And all the school websites are being updated too because they've all had information about on the different elementary school websites and stuff have had. That, that will all have to get updated, yes. I think Claudia, um, no, certainly we've discussed that she will break the links right. and, and readjust them. Okay. Ms. Hyam? Um, one thing, suggestion that was made by the redistricting subcommittee was um, some sort of outreach to the local real estate agents um, to actually share some of that information because um, people will st were still selling houses with the you're in the this district or the that district. Um, I would wonder if that sheet that some of the schools have put together might be appropriate to actually just provide copies to all the agents in town mm -hmm. um, and that might streamline the process further. Yeah. We have not done that yet, but, but I do remember that suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions? Um, um, I guess one last thing. I'm wondering if the parents come in and they don't speak English as their first language, what accommodation do we have for them to communicate with them? Oh, I am well, very crafty on that one. <laughs> all right, go ahead, Alec. Um We have had several of those, actually. So um, sometimes I will call on Carla. I know at one case, um, one case we actually found someone to interpret some of the materials i know the home language survey is in multiple languages so they will you know let us know what they're kind of looking for and we've gotten knock on wood we've gotten those who have come in through the process the letter that's going out to all the children that we've been identified through the census the there's besides the letter from me there's also a, another letter which tells them in, ver in, a, in a, several languages that if they need this translated, to who to contact. And we will get them translated. That's okay. what we'll have to do, yeah. But also, one of the things that the 
this is a more of a general comment in addition to central registration, is that the iPads have the ability to, for two-way communication between people. You can um, go to, this, I think there's 28 languages. It's one of the things that we thought why we were really attracted to this, so that, let's say, a principal wants to talk to someone who doesn't know any English, but they know the home language. They can type the question in on the iPad in that language. There's a translator that the, the per other person sees the question in their language and types back in their language, and then it, that's, that can go back and mm. forth. Now, that is not the way we want to conduct it all the time, but we certainly have that as a tool in addition to translators. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Augustino. And we look forward to updates on how it's proceeding. We'll let you know. It's the first three weeks in March. Um, and it's in the letter. Uh, I guess we probably should have put that up on a slide as to the dates uh, as for people who are listening. But it is all going out to everyone, everyone that, that has shown up on our census. It was mailed today, and it should mm -hmm. be there tomorrow or Saturday. And the dates are up and on the website? And the dates website. are the first three weeks of March. They're evening dates. We've, we've changed up the, the days of the week, so in case one, date, one, week, one uh, particular weekday does not work, but they all are from 4.30 to 7.30 here in the high school. And the first week, Leilani, are Tuesday and Thursday, right? Yep. Tuesday and Thursday of the first week. Oh, oh, you got the letter right there. Okay, thank you. They are on the web. But, and they are on the web. But just so I can say this to, to see if anybody's listening, mm -hmm. um, on the first week of March, it's Tuesday and Thursday, the 5th and the 7th. In week two, it is Wednesday and Thursday, the 13th and 14th. Week three is the 19th, uh, Tuesday the 19th. And we also have a snow day that week of Thursday. Wow. Okay. So that's, so these are all up on the web? Everything else Everything's on the web. It's okay. Send it back. Okay. Okay. Oh, Mr. Schlickman. Just to make sure there is no advantage for people to show up at 430 on March 5th over any other time. Over any other time, no. We have but. a central registration process in Lowell, and people think that the first person in the door <laughs> has some advantage over everybody else, and it's very crowded, so Can space I it out. Can I clarify? I thought that there's, there's no advantage if you don't live in a buffer zone. If, if you, you do. do live in a buffer zone, there is an advantage. There's an, I was going <laughs> to say, there's an advantage of coming on the first day. Mm -hmm. But there's no advantage to coming at 4:30, because oh, okay. because it's the date rather than the time mm -hmm. that that will create the wait list on a lottery basis. Then you might have an interesting line there on March. 5th. We are planning to staff really well that first week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Okay, and we move on to budget, but before I'd like to acknowledge that we are joined in our audience by our two state reps, yeah. uh, Mr. Garbley and Mr. Rogers. Thank you. Um, we appreciate your attention. Can we ask them to come up and say hello? Sure. Would you like to come up and say hello <laughs> at the microphone? Mm -hmm. Hi everybody. I know we're not on the agenda tonight, so thank you, Madam Chair, for taking us out of order, the members of the committee. Um, so I'm joined here with Representative Rogers, who wanted to come uh, and see a school committee meeting, and we didn't want to be on the agenda because we thought we would just come by and, and say hello. I know you're about to get into the budget debate, uh, which obviously will be a um, very interesting conversation. I once chaired the budget subcommittee, so I know it's not easy to do that, waiting for uh, the state to do their budget, which we are heavily involved in right now. We had our first uh, Ways and Means Committee hearing uh, this afternoon in Gardner, or earlier this morning, that went into the afternoon in Gardner Auditorium with a, a full committee, and it's gonna be a great conversation. And actually, one of the Ways and Means hearings will be held on March 4th 
in Arlington. And I will, I will be hosting that hearing, and it's going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning, but I will send uh, more information uh, to the committee on that, and the topic will be on health and human services. Uh, but I will send information to you on that. But great. I'll let Representative <laughs> Rogers uh, speak. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for, as Representative Garbley said, taking us sort of out of out of order, not really on the agenda. I really just wanted to come to observe and plan to do it um, more than just today. And um, obviously, we're going to be uh, strong advocates for the Arlington schools. And as Representative Garbley said, there's a coming uh, debate. Uh, could be a pitched battle over uh, the budget. And the governor, in his final two years, has chosen to perhaps advance his most ambitious agenda of his entire um, a time in office and uh, I for one am hopeful that um, there is success in convincing the legislature to invest more in education uh, which is um, I think vital and has been underfunded in my opinion uh, for a lot of different reasons so um, I don't want to intrude too much I plan to uh, just observe today and but thank you for being so gracious to ask us to uh, say a few words. I really appreciate it and look forward to working with you. And please call, write, email anytime, and I'll get right back to you. Great. Thank you. Ms. Hine? Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by thanking you in advance, Mr. Rogers, for everything you're going to be doing for us in the future. But since Mr. Garbley, Representative Garbley, is here, I want to take this advantage to publicly thank him. Um, on State Civics Day, he went out of his way to help arrange for some of the students that were participating to get a special tour of the State House, um, get to actually sit in representative chairs, and left a very positive impact on a number of young people um, about what their role in future politics in the, and just the state of Massachusetts could be. And so even though you're no longer on the school committee, we appreciate everything you do to help the students of Massachusetts. Thank you very much. I know many of you have uh, actually sent emails. I received emails from a couple of school committee members today on uh, revenue. And so we will have, be having that conversation. But I do agree with uh, Representative Rogers uh, on that front. Um, so great. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. And thank you for joining us thank in you. our audience. And now we move on to budget. Yes. All right. Um, this evening, is our planned budget presentation. This process began back in the fall. And as we do every year, we, we take a look internally at where we are, what we need to be doing in the way of resources to improve. Some of, the, some of our improvement isn't so much related to budget, but it has to do with systems or professional development, um, the way we do things. But as, we, as you're aware, back in the fall, we, the administrative team created a list divided by tiers in terms of uh, particular things that felt that we needed for the FY14 budget and for outgoing years. So that process began, as I said, back in November. We had the principals come and present in December, uh, both uh, discussion about their perspective on the budgets and their needs f for their schools, as well as their improvement plans and how the improvement plans for their schools related to the budget. Um, as, the, as the process evolved with the, the budget subcommittee, uh, we're very much a part of this and setting up the timeline for where we are tonight, the budget subcommittee uh, looked at um, the, the issue of where we needed to be able, we needed to increase um, funds for next year and created categories uh, that we were able to then align the particular particular items or the staffing that we needed to those categories and the categories are, are here uh, let me go through them in just a second but I just want to say how we're going to organize tonight's presentation I'm just going to my role in this will give us sort of an overview a framework of where we are and then Diane Johnson, who, as you all know, is our CFO, will go through the specific numbers. We will then take a look at the budget books. And I want people that are listening tonight to know that we have made the budget, uh, all these budget documents live um, earlier this evening. And uh, you can just go to our website, 
And I, I think it's right actually on the, Diane, it's right on the, uh, the home page right now, isn't it? Uh, our webmaster put it as the first news item. So if first you click news. on that, it'll take you right mm -hmm. to the PDF of the budget. So if you want to follow this when we actually get into line items or any line item discussion, you'll be able to, to do that. All right, so in terms of budget priorities that um, the budget subcommittee uh, dis gave us sort of a framework for how, what we needed to be doing with our FY14 budget. At, at, the, at the very beginning of this process, we're looking to, to have a level service budget. And a level service budget means that what we are doing this year, the staffing that we have this year would be the same next year. And w if we were to have a level service budget, what type of additional funds could be available either through town appropriation or from grants that would allow us to do improvements or to add additional staff. And we'll talk about the, the, the numbers of that in a, in a couple minutes. But in terms of the categories in which we would want to um, align our increases, as I said, ma maintain level service. The other is that we are opening Thompson School, which the side is on time and I'm, I have total confidence that we're going to open in September, is we want Thompson School to open with the same complement of staffing uh, as all of our other elementary schools. And some of those positions have been carried forward from when Thompson was a, um, a, an existing school, but some staffing were not and also since in the last two years, we have reorganized some of our special education staffing, and so there's additional staffing that will need to be um, hired in order to make sure that we have uh, that all of our elementary schools are equitable. We very much need to have professional development as something we focus on next year, both in terms of um, aligning our curriculum providing teachers with uh, an, a deep understanding of the standards in the Common Core. And also, as you know, we're, we're entering to a new form of teacher and actually all educator evaluation system next year. And, and, all, and both of these initiatives, major in and of themselves, is going to require professional development. And we need to make sure that there are the resources resources for that. But in addition, and we'll talk more about this as we get into the spring, is the training that's going to be required at the state level for SEI, which is a form of um, training for, for differentiation for ELL, English language learner students in classrooms. Um, we also know that we have had a focus this year and will continue to have a focus on Mathematics instruction both at the elementary and the middle school. And we'll take a look at the ways that we're going to, to enhance that support next year. We, wanted, we know that we need, as a district, to become more competitive uh, for substitutes. Our substitute um, pay rate has, I think, was back in the late 90s when it was first set, and it has not changed. Uh, in, in all these years, and we had made a proposal to uh, increase that. We also know that we need to always update our materials, and we particularly need with the Common Core Standards to update our materials for mathematics and literacy. We, kn we know that it's going to be important next year for have equitable and more support at the administrative level at the middle and the high school with the new educator evaluation system and um, we also need to provide for staffing res reserves, both for enrollment increases and, and perhaps for any kind of special education services. So those became the framework for the types of, of, of whether the specific items that we, were t we in included in the budget, they fell into one of those kinds of, of frameworks. So we look at the Common Core Standards and coaching and teaching, what is this going to look like in terms of particular additions next year? And uh, we are looking for two elementary math coaches and one additional middle school math support teacher. We'll talk a little bit 
later uh, that one of one way that we're going to be able to fund one of the elementary math coaches uh, and 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 then the additional one would be through this through the operating budget we also are going to fund curriculum materials for students in grades three through six mathematics materials we need elementary literacy materials we are going to have additional world language staffing at the middle and the high school, um, increased instructional leadership at the middle and the high school, and of course, as we have in the past years, we've always put in some reserve teachers because uh, enrollment changes can be um, unpredictable as best as uh, we can at this point know what they're going to be. Our hope, of course, is that the new buffer zone redistricting system we have will help um, equalize that a little bit and perhaps make it a little bit less um, uh, unpredictable in terms of staffing. So going to another uh, important focus is enhancing education for all of our students. And as you know from um, Kathleen Lockyer's presentation back um, earlier this in earlier January, uh, she talked about the way that we are going to be improve our delivery of special education services next year, and the the improvement um, is in several ways. One is that we are going to have a learning two learning specialists to support students at each elementary school. Currently, we have only one except for at Pierce. Well, the elementary, all the six, six of the elementary school will have two. Pierce will re remain with uh, four learning specialists. And each one of those learning specialists will have a, a teaching assistant uh, that, work, that they work with and can help uh, with the learning needs of the students. And we're gonna be dividing it into a K-2 grouping and a 3-5 grouping at each one of the elementary schools. As an aside, we can talk a little bit more about this in terms of funding, but a lot of the, the, the special education changes that we're doing, um, we've been able to identify ways to have that be somewhat of a wash with our current system by just how we've reallocated teaching positions and TA positions going forward. So we are also, as I said, looking to provide um, related service people at Thompson. We're, we're going to need a half-time psychologist and OT so that we can keep, as we have done this year, building-based models. We have found that the work we've done this year already is, is both certainly anecdotally very successful um, it will be helpful to see what the data shows in terms of student achievement as we move forward. But certainly in terms of how people are perceiving it, they, f they find the changes this year even very beneficial. But we also need to have um, another uh, board certified behavior analyst and um, uh, some more be behavior support personnel. And then we'll have teaching assistance for both short and long term needs. So moving forward, in terms of another major category, infrastructure support, um, you've, you've already had the presentation on central registration, but one of the things that we, we know already, and in fact we've been sort of piecemealing it this year as best as we can, is that we do need um, support in, in central registration, which we call the Student Enrollment Center. Um, Another change is that currently we have 1.45 vacant custodial positions, and we're thinking of changing that and, and creating a night supervisor. So we'll have a day supervisor, and we'll, then we'll also have uh, an evening, a night su supervisor. And then going back to the one of the categories of substitute, we are going to increase the rate of pay for both daily and long-term substitutes. And um, Diane can tell you what she's figured out as to what we can actually be able to offer within our budget next year, which will be a, a marked improvement. So that's sort of an overview of what the categories were. You've had that tiered list, and we've been able to slot pretty much, in fact, 
everything that we had in that tier one and tier two star levels, we've been fits into one of the categories that the school committee has determined that is the areas they want to see um, the enhancements. And, it, and we've been able to, through some creative budgeting, looking at grants, reorganization um, within the district, we're going to be able to fund next year in this, in the budget, in FY14. So I think we're moving now, and, and Diane can talk more about uh, the specifics of the numbers. But before we move into that piece of it, I don't know if there's anything that you'd want to ask, and maybe it will come up and we actually get into the specifics. Mr. Hainer. Just a quick question. And do we own the custodians, or does the town? We do. We Fiscally. hire them. We, they're Fiscally. our employees. Fiscally, they're in our budget. We pay them. They come out of our money. I understand. Do we hire them? The hiring process is handled under Mark Miano, who is technically under the DPW director. Mark Miano is the okay. facilities manager of the entire town. Okay. So we pay for them. We manage, well, can we, can a principal authorize uh, overtime for them? It's usually done in concert with Mark. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. it's discussed together, and I, I'm always, I sign the slips, so I, get, I, I, I know okay. about it, too. It's just a confusing thing. It is confusing. It, it is kind of a hybrid model, and, and without okay. the diplomacy of Mark Miano, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work very well, but it does work pretty well. It, it works well because of the people that are doing it. it they, people work very well together on this. Absent that, it could cause lots of issues. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other level, this level of question? Okay. Nope. Well, we move on. All right. Thank you. I don't know if you need a Oh, sorry. You want me to go past this? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Right there. Is that where you want to be? Yes. Thank you. Um, the total amount for the FY13 budget was just over, it was just shy of uh, $51 million. We're in, in our revenue anticipations for next year, we have a solid number from the town appropriation. That number continues to include the $970,000 offset for kindergarten fees, so there will be no kindergarten fees in this budget. Um, and it represents the growth that's been laid out in the multi-year plan that's done in cooperation between town and school. Grants, the entitlement grants are projected to drop by 8% in this budget scenario. That's very conservative. But since we don't know what's going to happen in Washington, at the time we were building the budget, that seemed like the safest model to make. However, if you compare the numbers in actuality, it doesn't look like there's much of a drop, and that's because of the influx of the Project Success Grant that's coming online in this budget cycle. And our revolving revenues are roughly flat. We're using our actual FY13 circuit breaker number, because we know what that'll be, and that will be funding FY14. And there's a slight reduction in, um, in what we think we're going to take in for building, building rental revenues, and we've eliminated the lab credit. So those are, those are the basic revenue assumptions that, that this budget is built on. It gives us a, a total increase in revenue just shy of $2 million. And just uh, to graphically represent the allocation of our budget, uh, the town appropriation in this budget is roughly 90% of our total funding, but it is important to remember that grants and revolving fees and reimbursements make up a significant, um, a significant part of our budget. It's particularly important when we get to town meeting because we're, unu we're an unusual department for the town in that respect. Okay. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Shukman. I'm just wondering if we can't break this town appropriation data out because I think it's really important to parcel out what's local tax revenue appropriated out of uh, local revenues versus what's coming in under Chapter 70. Well, that wouldn't really be consistent with how we, we receive the revenues. You know, we, the town commits to our revenues regardless of what's happening on Chapter 70 or other factors. You know, they give us the money and they bear the flux. It can be done, certainly, but, you know, they've, they've committed to this number for us regardless. They, they've committed that number uh, regardless of what the number of the local aid is. I understand the situation under the, uh, uh, the fiscal stability plan, but... Uh, when we're going before town meeting and making arguments to the town about how much of town 
revenue is t local tax money is being contributed into the schools vis-a-vis -vis how much in tax revenue is collected uh, I, I think it's important for us to to be able to be clear as to how much we're receiving from locally generated tax dollars versus what's coming in under chapter 70. So just to clarify since I'm not sure so would you just break up what the current another, split another, is another slice of the pie right yeah. but I'm saying you would just take what last year's well, we last well, year's we, we do have was. we do have an estimated number for chapter 70 under a house one and we should use that as our baseline number right now okay, but that, that's I'm saying which number you're using last yeah, year if, if you're talking about the fiscal 13 budget we use the number that was actually appropriated yeah. Okay. Uh, by the legislature for okay. fiscal 14, we're we're using their projection, okay. because the, you know I I think that you know in terms of dealing with town meeting, uh, and parents, it, it's important for people to understand that difference, and we we are talking on the floor of town meeting about how much of the money is being raised from local tax revenue, and that's okay. sort of the bottom line on budget 20. Right. So are you really just interested in seeing the Chapter 70 broken out, or are you going to want to follow the trail of free cash versus tax? No, 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 no. Just, just break out the Chapter 70 versus, you know, okay. truly local revenue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Mr. Hayner. That's doable. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, though, mm -hmm. I mean, if we're really going to try a PR thing in here, and mm -hmm. the major uh, taxpayer is looking at the, uh, how much the individual property taxes mm -hmm. are, the more slices we can put to that pie and move that green back. Because right now, that looks to me like mm -hmm. the taxpayer property is coming all that green. In reality, it isn't. Mm -hmm. It's the, the Chapter 70 and all the, okay. the other pieces of the pie. I, I'm sorry, it's more work for you. No, no, but it, it's fine. I just want to be clear on what's mm -hmm. desired so I, I can mean, give I mean, I'd suggest to the committee that the, the smaller we can make that property tax thing, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It is it is still coming from from all of us though. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, understand. It, it's coming in a much mm -hmm. lower amount. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Schleckman. But I think I, but I think there's an important argument to be made here is that under the terms of the uh, of the fiscal revenue plan we've got, if our chapter 78 increases, the town will give us less money. Right because that's the agreement. They're, they've agreed on the bottom line. You mean the town will give us less money less out money of property Less money of town taxes. money. So we're not, because it, it's an unusual position that in most towns, if the Chapter 70 money goes up, it's right. you know, it more, more money to the schools. But if all of a sudden the newspaper reports that we're getting another $1 million in Chapter 78, all that's going to happen with this is that same number is going to go and that pie is going to shift a little. Right. And these, these are important mm -hmm. things for us to be communicating within our budget document and our budget okay. process. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I think we need to move on. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Ms. Johnson. Um, in terms of the proposed budget changes for FY14 to meet our obligations of level service, um, we need $1.5 million. Um, the, the, bulk of that is steps lanes contract obligations mm -hmm. we're proposing another one point a uh, little bit more than 1.5 million dollars in new initiatives and we are proposing a little bit more than 1.1 million dollars in restructuring to help fund those proposed new initiatives which brings us back into balance with our available revenue and that's uh, a graphic representation of major categories within the proposed budget just so you can see where our funds are going. Um, I always find this pie really interesting to look at because when I think of the things that worry me and take up a lot of my time, then sometimes they seem to be relatively smaller segments of the pie. But it's just nice to see what, what we're funding. Is that it? Oh, good. Scared me. <laughs> <laughs> I pressed down and nothing was there. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so turning to the budget books, um, and if you are viewing online you can go to the Arlington Public Schools main page and under the first news item click on the link it is a searchable PDF the budget is organized into sections as it was last year section one gives a very high level overview of what's going on and has some graphs to 
the two of the two graphs that were just shown here and a couple of other graphs that show long-term trends based on end-of-year reporting categories. Section two is the superintendent's budget message, which is the narrative description of what we're trying to do with this budget. It also includes a more detailed breakout of all of the changes that we're proposing um, and a line-by-line -line description of each of those changes. Section three is the funding summary. And again, just to reiterate the assumptions, the town appropriation amount is that from the multi-year plan. The grants number assumes an 8% increase in our entitlement grants, shows the influx of the project success grant, the loss of the Teaching American History grant, all of which were, have been known previously. And the revolving, the revolving fees picks up the FY13 circuit breaker number, which we will be spending in 14, because we're rolling our circuit breaker forward one year. And the elimination of lab credit and a slight reduction in building rental fees. Could it, are we going to ask Mr. questions Hain. as we go through this? Um, I thought let's let her do the quick overview, and then we'll come back and ask questions. Okay, fine. The budget, uh, section four is the budget transfer summary. Um, the top page uh, shows the FY14 proposed budget broken out by major categories that were set by the school committee. Um, but it excludes grant funding, so that's why the numbers look a little bit different. We pull the grants out and we just look at town appropriation and revolving or fee-based money uh, by major category. And then this, the following pages in that section are just back up to each of those numbers. Section six is a cost center summary. So if you wanted to see what it's costing at a school or in a department, this is where you would look. I think you meant section five. Five. Section five. five. I did mean five. I, I apologize. Um, section six is the program summary. <coughs> this is, if you're actually interested in sport by sport for athletics, this is a great place to go to look and see what we're, what we're, what we have spent and what we're expecting to spend, sport by sport, um, and other um, thematic looks at our, what we do here. Mm -hmm. The next section is the object summary. This is where you would go to see total teacher salary, um, all aggregated together, um, total out of district special education tuition, major categories of expense. Uh, this is where you would want to look if those are the numbers you're looking for. The next section is the budget t t detail um, by cost center, program, and object. This is the most finely granulated part of the budget. If you wanted to know specifically, this is where you would look. The other sections are higher levels of summary, so depending mm -hmm. on what you're interested in. On the web, this section is searchable, which is I think is a really neat feature, courtesy of our webmaster, Claudia. Um, Bertoli, who does an amazing job, and that's very handy. You can put in a keyword like legal and keep pressing next, and it will take you to every reference of legal and the numbers associated with it. The next position, the next section is position control, where we compare um, our present salaries and what they will cost next year. So this is, basically, this is where you can see the contract increases at the smallest level of granularity. And then there's two, the, the next two sections are specialty sections. The first is special ed. This is where you see all of special ed pulled together, the special ed department, the special ed services based at each school, the, uh, the special learning communities, the SLC A, B, and C, special ed transportation are all aggregated in this section. So if you want a big picture view of all of SPED and you don't want to go pulling it through every part of the budget, this is where you would go. Um, and the next section is athletics. This is where you see all of athletics aggregated in one place. And finally, it wraps up with a description of how the chart of accounts works. And um, I believe there's an index on the final page to help guide you to a particular section if you're interested. If you go to the PDF online, those are hot links, so you can click on it and it will take you right to that section. Additionally, you have a pink sheet that looks like this that was tonight on your desk. And this is an analysis of 
the substitute pay increases, and I'd just like to take a moment to walk you through it. On top, you see the analysis for daily subs, and on the bottom, the analysis is repeated for long-term subs. I tried to think about how best to do this, and what I decided to do was to back into an average number of sub days. I really only have two full years of data, FY11 and FY12, from which to draw this, and a partial data for FY13. So two and a half years isn't really a great average, and so I don't want to put too much stock in that, which is why I want to be a little conservative in this, but it's just a place to start from. Um, based on that average daily sub days, I multiplied it by the current rate in the first column, which is $60 a day, and that gives us an estimated annual cost. The line below that says the 14 budget as proposed, and you'll notice that that is the same amount of money all the way across. And the bottom line shows the differential. So if we were to have the same number of sub days as our average presently, um, we could afford to go up to $75 with the proposed budget, and that will keep us in the black, unless, of course, you know, sub days are something you can't lock down precisely. Um, but I did run the analysis out through, you know, starting at the current rate of 60 and up to a top rate of 90. But there is not sufficient, in my opinion, there is not sufficient funding to support a day rate of 90 at this point. It's the exact same analysis at the bottom, but the, the current daily rate is different for long-term subs. And, we're, and based on this analysis, I'm proposing that we raise the average daily sub rate to $75 per day and the, from 60, and that the long-term sub rate go from $100 a day to $115 a day. Could I, if I just get a clarification? Mr. The average daily sub, is that just for sick and personal days, or does that also include some uh, curriculum days, or? That's all subs. Uh, okay, and what do, what defines a long-term sub? Ten or more days? Yeah, I mean, typically we put people in as long-term subs to cover for extended leaves. Typically it's maternity leaves in the districts. It's usually when we know someone's going to be covering for eight to 12 weeks or even longer. Um, those are really the long-term. So it doesn't start at the 10th consecutive day? No, I, I think we can do it sort of both ways. That Wait, there's, um, I'm just concerned because 1,599, and I understand it's just two years, but if, at 10 days, or just at 10 days, that's 15,099 days. That's an awful lot of absences. <coughs> Uh, well, we've had, I mean, I think we've had quite a few maternity leaves in district the last few years, and I think that's what that reflects. Okay. Does that reflect, when you say 1599 for the average, is that the amount of days for those two? Thank you. That, that's not the amount of pe the individual people. Okay. No, that's days. Thank you. That, that, that's days of everybody. Okay. Yeah. That, I feel much better about this. <laughs> the other change that we're proposing in this budget is that the uh, the building subs that we have at the high school and the middle school will go to a TA rate of pay. They were below, they were significantly below that previously, but in this budget, mm. we're taking them up to the TA rate. Okay. Um, any other words before we start diving in? Okay. Um, so we didn't really discuss how we were going to discuss this, but I thought we can just go through and see if people have clarification questions or something. Let's just start at section one and move on. As you're going through this, um, as you can see, the, our administrative team is not here tonight. Um, I thought that it would be better for you to think about if there's any questions. So for example, if there were questions about special education, people know that we're gonna ask them to come on the 28th. And that's also the day of the hearing, but so, we can get department heads in here on the 28th if you'd like that. Okay. But okay. isn't that also the night of the hearing? The hearing? Yeah. We can get, hopefully we can get answers. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. So does anyone have any questions on uh, section number one? No. Does anyone have any questions in section number two? Oh, I mean, just on section one. Uh-huh. In the uh, budget expenditures over time, and budget expenditures as a percentage of total budget, uh, I'm just, you know, I can understand everything in here except Minuteman, which really isn't ours. It, it is part of our report to the DESE. And uh -huh. so when I originally started doing this report, I was pulling the numbers back from the DESE. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't 
I didn't extract them, so I'm just following precedent and continuing to carry that. Well, it also has employee health benefits, which is not in our budget either. Well, it, it, it's, it's a local item that's it, it, coming from here. Minuteman is a separate entity. Indeed. Yeah. And I, and I think that just telling our story, it, it's important for us to tell our story. If we're going to tell a story of the percentage of expenditures to Minuteman vis-a-vis -vis the expenditures in Arlington, pulling that out and making a separate chart I think would be totally appropriate, but getting it into our budget expenditures chart is muddying things for a discussion of where our 40 whatever well, million but dollars. But if you'll are. look, I mean, this is yeah. this budget is running around $70 million because that's the total end of year report that includes all town expenditures and the Department of Education asks us to report on Minuteman as a town expenditure. But in terms of, we're, we're, this, this is a document not for the state, this is uh, for the community and going to town meeting. And when we're talking about town meeting, they're taking a look at that bottom line number that we're getting from them, the appropriation plus the uh, Chapter 70. So that when we're doing an analysis of our, you know, it, it, it is definitely appropriate to, to pull out another chart and show how much is going to the school system, how much is an indirect expense being charged elsewhere in the report, and how much is being, uh, uh, it's not subject to our appropriation and how much is going to Minuteman. That's, that's certainly an appropriate conversation to have. But in, in this chart here, when we're talking about how we split out our expenditures as a district, I think we need to keep that clean and keep mm -hmm. that limited to stuff that's being spent in, in Arlington. Dr. Bennett. Mm -hmm. Would it help if underneath that um, rubric we have on the side there, mm -hmm. We put in parentheses underneath that uh, something to the effect that not school department budget, so that they know that that, so that at least they would be able to keep in the growth uh, columns here. But <laughs> your point is well taken. That yeah, is, it, that it, it does muddy it a bit. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, we do have, you know, if, if we're looking as, a, as policy people and, and, and making, uh, a clear presentation to town meeting. They, they do need to know that the, the, we're, what we're spending and why and how and how it's allocated. And because people often will go to the state website and take a look at uh, minimum local spending and uh, uh, local contribution. By the way, the local contribution to Minuteman doesn't show up under ours, it shows up on the Minuteman, so it's not gonna be within, within our DESE uh, calculation. Okay. But yeah, I mean, th these are these are multiple arguments that, that really need to be made and out there. And the budget expenditures locally, I think, is an important thing to be showing, and not and not having Minuteman because that's what we're, we're controlling for is is really important. That's our story to tell. Okay, Ms. Hyam. Um, I was just going to piggyback a little bit on Mr. Schlickman's point. I think all we need to do is change the title of that table to townwide educational budget expenditures and then mm -hmm. the telling our story mm -hmm. the second portion becomes budget expenditures as a townwide educational budget expenditures telling our story we had a third chart in with arlington public schools budget expenditures added in because you know, we want we want them to mm -hmm. to get that all of the towns what the town spends mm -hmm. on education doesn't all come to this body. Mm -hmm. It is important for them to see that contrast, mm -hmm. but we also want to show them how much we do with what we do get. Mm -hmm. And so, seeing that mm -hmm. that fact that some of this is like a fifth of what the town spends on education never makes it in mm -hmm. to this organization is an important part of the story. Mm -hmm. that, so okay, important. that's right, but that's not actually true because it's employee benefits for our teachers. Yeah. So mm -hmm. even right, though it, it does, doesn't, it's not controlled it's by not, school but it doesn't, committee. When but, I say this part of the story, I mean mm -hmm. the budget that this school committee mm -hmm. controls. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And the budget that the superintendent administers. And we work very closely with the town manager when it is time to discuss salary and compensation of the employees here. So mm -hmm. while we do have input, that is also a town decision. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Okay. Um, I'd like to keep moving on. Um, so into section two. Um, do people have questions at this point? Uh, I'm going to ask questions later. Okay. And sorry, I have to look at my questions too. And sorry. Okay, moving on to section three. Any questions? Mr. Hayner. Uh, on the, uh, I think it's the, under revolving fees and reimbursements, when you come down to building rental fees, mm -hmm. there's a reduction of $50,000. Mm -hmm. We have an additional school coming online next year. How, why are we anticipating 50,000 less with another school available? When we had been, when I did the first budget in FY11, which was the first budget I did, I lowered our building fee expectations based on the run rates I was seeing at the time. And then in FY12, we had a banner year that far exceeded the $200,000 we were counting on. So <coughs> for FY13, I increased it to 350 to reflect the great year we had in FY12. I do not believe that 350 is the long-term run rate. Having more years of data now, I think 300 is a more reasonable run rate on building rentals. With the Thompson coming online, if we see it spike up and stay up, I will adjust that in future years. Okay. But as I have more years of data, I'm just going to try I, to correct. You understand where I was coming from. Sure. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Moving on to Section 4, does anyone have any questions? Um, I see none. Moving on to Section... What? Whoops, sorry. I couldn't Mr. flip Hayden. them all. Uh, the... You tell us what page you're on. Page. I'm sorry. Page uh, 1 of 2. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, I guess it's under transfer detail curriculum instructions. It's uh, under its uh, professional development. Is it, well, there's two, there's well, two. There are different groupings two, here, two so there are a lot different the ones grouping. of two. I'm sorry. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I was having PDF problems and converting my Excel files to PDF and the pagination got groupings. kind of goofed up. This is the second to last page in the tab. Okay. Yes. That helps. Yeah. Under professional development, uh, does this does this section here, this money here, does this include the uh, in, inclusion, professional development for inclusion? Yes. Okay. I, okay. I, but it would not include any professional development money that is grant funded. So there is professional development money that resides in Title Two A, Title. Uh, what do we use that for then? What? What would we use that for? Title II A is all about professional development. Okay, I'm sorry. So remember, this is just town appropriation and revolving revenues. This does, this excludes grants in this section. Okay, and the page just prior to that, the SPED testing, there's a pretty big increase. Again, one of the things that makes this a little complex is that in some budget, in some years, the SPED grant carries certain kinds of expenses, and then it carries others. So you may not be seeing an actual drop in expenses. You may be seeing a different revenue source. So if you're really looking to see if, so, if we're, what we're spending on something, this is not the section to be looking at because oh, it oh. excludes the grants. Okay, but up, up right beside it, the expect you budgeted for fifth, we budget for uh, 13, 38. Our expended expected expenditure is 22. What is the program, please? I'm sorry. Uh, 45. 45. Testing and assessment. Testing and assessment. Mm -hmm. And you're anticipating. 6860. I'm sorry, thank you. You're anticipating $16,000 less than we budgeted, which is fine, but now we're budgeting back to the 39000 again. With the, it's a, a slight increase from what's budgeted from 13. So that we, are we anticipating, is that what you were just talking about, the differences in the grants? Thank you. Okay. Seeing no more questions. Moving on to section five. Any questions here? Sure. Mr. Hayner. Uh, on, I think it's page one of one, uh, cost center is 60 superintendent. The superintendent's budget is $822,000. We've shifted, well, it, because it contains legal fees. Mm -hmm. I saw that later. Mm -hmm. Do I wait for later for the legal fees to yes. discuss it? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, we fine. wait for later. 
right, so and also other? some professional development money that had been sitting in the superintendent's budget has been shifted to the assistant superintendent. That's a decrease, not an increase. That, fine. Thank you. There is a decrease in the superintendent in the assistant or in the superintendent's budget has okay. dropped. Moving on to question to section six. Any questions here? Seeing none, we move yes, on. Oops, sorry, um, Mr. Hainer. Page number. Page uh, nine. Uh, three or four. Three or four. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Leftmost number. I, so I got a, I got a whole. Oh. Go all the way to the left and tell us what number you're at. S uh, the 6965 custodial services. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a decrease in custodial services. Where do you see a decrease? Um, it's under FY. This is under FY 14 restructuring. restructuring. Yes. Yes. That that, that is the going. that is the the, the sixty five thousand is the two. Um, that is the increase. What, what am I looking at? The the money is coming out of custodial, and the management is in facilities maintenance just above it. Okay, that would be the nighttime person. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay, moving on to section seven. Mr. Hainer. 81117, it's on page one of three. Mm -hmm. Could you just tell me what other full-time salaries and wages means? Sure, um, other full-time salaries incorporates our, our nurses, it incorporates our IT staff, it incorporates some of uh, one of my staff, it incorporates who are some of the other full-time other category people. Um, Long-term subs are in here. Okay. Um, people that are not in a union, but are, you know, sort of the odd duck people who are non-unionized would be in this category for the most part. But that wouldn't include our secretary or the superintendent secretary? No, those would be, those would be clerical. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions here? Yes. Okay. Oh. 81305, what is night watch? Um, there is a, an additional, there is an additional charge for custodians who have to work a, it's like a shift differential for night when and, they come in. In the past two years it's gone up considerably? No, in the past two years we've started tracking it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically some of these things we're just disaggregating. Okay. So to get a better beat on what we're spending on these things down further at 81318 teacher moving allowances aren't we into are we anticipating that people going back to Thompson in this fiscal year yes but those are project costs mm -hmm. those are, they come out of the Thompson yeah. building project so what were, what did we pay twenty six thousand dollars for in teaching move allowance two years ago well it wasn't just Thompson people that were moving people around. lots of people were shuffling around as a result of things <coughs> thank you it, it's contractual. Ms. No, Mr. I understand Schlickman. that. Mr. Schlickman gets to answer, ask a question. Uh, where, where do the traffic supervisors fall in here? They are under part-time other. Part-time other. So okay. they would be 81118. Okay. Okay, Mr. Hainer. Uh, there are two things in here, 81765. Um, we, it says auto cell phone allowance, but later on some, in a couple of places we have pagers. Are those two different things? Yes. Okay. And our anticipated cost for fiscal 13 is only $692? Yes, but remember this is a guess. You know, when I do these projections, it's my best guess of how things are going to play out. Well, it, without going into much detail, we have two contracts right within the room that are over $100, they're $100 a month, so that would take it to $2,000. But they may not necessarily land on this line. Those expenses may be landing on another line. Remember, I'm in the process of chasing all these expenses and making sure they're landing in the right way, and over these years, I'm going for the low-hanging fruit. Things like telephone expenses may not be hitting to exactly the right place. Okay. That's how much we're spending district-wide, but we may not be seeing those expenses on that line right yet. So oh. where would, all right. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Hainer. Next page, 83102, legal services. Is that, 
both, uh, how can I say it, all our legal services or? That represents our special ed legal services and our general legal services. We have an additional $200,000 budgeted yes, for settlements under 87601. Does that include the legal services we were talking about earlier under the superintendents? Yes. So Some what? of them live in SPED. Some of them live under the superintendent's budget. So you t I take those two and that should add up to this three, 370? Correct. Thank you. Okay, the next one is the telephone pages. You've already answered that one. Thank you. Uh, on this page, 83404, and then on the next page, 85101, this page calls for reproduction printing at 83404, and then we have 85101 reproduction supplies. Yeah, well, printing, <coughs> printing jobs would be, you know, actually sending it out to a printer. Thank you. You know, business cards, letterhead, the budget documents. Yep. The other is paper toner and ink that's being chewed up. Thank the you. school buildings. Next line, 83405 postage. We've got a dramatic increase there. Can you? Well, I've put some money there because it does seem to be creeping up and I don't know how much we're going to need. So that's placeholder money. Mm -hmm. But again, remember, this is not how we control the budget. A, a principal gets X amount of money, mm -hmm. whether it's budgeted in postage, books, <laughs> instructional materials, the principal has the discretion on that amount of money to the bottom line to spend it on those items that they need. I understand, but to go from 289, 290, Estimated this year at 875 to 2200 just seems like a, a big jump. Thank you. Anything more in section seven? Moving on to section eight. Okay, and I'm going to give other people a chance. Yes. <laughs> no, Go no right I'm ahead. not. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm no, not no. trying to squelch you. No, you don't have any. I'm just give me look. Um. Okay, so no one has, um, I'm looking for other people yeah. for questions. No one has questions and I'm going to start in on mine because I've got mine. I am confused overall how facilities maintenance is budgeted for all the, for all the schools. Um, can you explain? I can. Um, it is very confusing. I'm trying to get the best of both worlds. I want to see what our expenditures are for facilities in each of the individual buildings. However, to try to guess how much we're gonna need in plumbing, HVAC, and all the other things that we wanna look at, because we wanna know how much we're spending on plumbing district-wide, and HVAC, and windows, and masonry. We wanna know those things, so I'm keeping that level of detail. But if I try to budget it out to every single school, I will drive myself to madness. So what I'm doing is I'm budgeting it in cost center 75 facilities, okay. but I'm expending it out in each school. So I can go back, if you look in the actuals, you can go back through each of those schools and see what's been spent in facilities. Okay. But if you look in 14, you won't see budget for those kind of repairs in the schools themselves. The money's all sitting in cost center 75. How can we look at what was spent in prior years and compare it to what is budgeted? I can look at it because I obviously have the data in a live format. Right. So I can pull all the schools, you know, by, pro by object or by program, you can aggregate all of those things. I understand you can see it, but how can we see it here? Because when I looked at it, it's like there's money and then it disappears. And right. then it appears down here. You, which can't, you cannot see budget versus actual except at, say, the program level, level six, nine, or 6965, 6960, that would show you all of the facilities maintenance district wide, and you would see budget versus actual because that's aggregated that way. Okay. You can't see it by cost center because expenses at the schools are sitting in the co school cost center, they're not sitting in cost right. center 75. Right. So programmatically would be one way to capture it, but it gives you no detail. Right. The other way to look at it is you can look school by school through the, the detailed section and you can see all, you know, that, that we did X amount of masonry at the bracket or whatever. You can see all those expenses sitting in FY11 and FY12. You can see them very clearly, but there's no budget amount against that. Okay, tell so, me again, you know, what's the number for, for, for maintenance for program? 
Um, let me, it's going off the top of my I'm head. I'm moving back to always seven, dangerous. Six, six, I think it's 6960. Six, 6960 six, oh is facilities maintenance. Okay. So that's where you see it squished together. Okay. So it's. I mean, I could arbitrarily break up the budgets for maintenance for each building, but that just seems like an awful lot of number shuffling to no good purpose. I just wanted to know how to, and, and it got confusing because we it didn't have anything. To, yeah, I've, okay. I struggle with this. Okay. You know, when, when I initially inherited this budget, facilities was only budgeted and only expensed at the facilities level, and so we didn't right. know how much we spent on this school versus that right. school. Okay. And the MSBA, when we were doing the process with the Stratton, was like, well, what do you mean you don't have maintenance and, and expense totals for this building? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't have them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, you should. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to, and it really does make sense to know how much are you spending on a building. Right. So oh, that's, okay. what, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Um, Mr. Pierce. Ms. Johnson, why, um, 6560 METCO total, mm. that's dropped a little bit. Just Thanks. wondering. This is on page 41 and 56. What section? Um, eight. Well, remember, we're projecting an 8% decrease in grants. And so I would, have, I would have reduced that to fit within the grant budget. Grant. Okay. Thanks. You know, and if the grant comes in, you know, METCO will spend whatever we're granted. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm moving back to page 10. <clears throat> Um, there are decreases. Um, I'm looking at 6512 and the following few columns. There's decreases in ELL, in English, and in uh, FACTS, and they're not listed on the um, reduction sheet, and I'm just wondering what's happening there. They are, they represent where bodies have shifted that the ELL position that may have been budgeted at Audison may now be living at the high school. Okay. So those are internal shiftings that are going okay. on. They're not, they don't represent loss of positions. Okay. They just represent budget reallocations. Okay. Um, on page 27, where's the Thompson heat? There, heat is one of the things that I, is still being budgeted centrally, and I'm playing with the okay. idea whether that should be Okay. In or out. So you okay. would find heat for the entire district under cost center 75. Okay. Excuse me. I'd like to make a recommendation, if possible, to uh, separate it per building because we're going to have a fairly efficient building online next year. We probably got the most inefficient building we're sitting in right now. So we track we the expenses. I have spreadsheets where we maintain a, a detailed history of what we spend building okay. by building. I just don't think budgeting it really Fine. saves me a Fine. lot of stuff. Okay. That makes sense. As long as we know. Oh, we do. Good. We're watching that. Okay. We watch it, and the um, energy group for the town watches it as well. Okay. Page 33. What's, why does health and wellness go up by so much? Because of the new grant that's coming online. The project success is in that, okay. in that area. And you'll notice that, um, conversely, the uh, social studies budget drops significantly. But because the... Of the teacher salaries, are those actually, it's, it's listed under 8112, it's under 6710, and then? Again, this, is, this has been one of the areas I've struggled with, with going from a more centralized budget to a decentralized budget. You know, are the phys ed teachers allocated to the school budgets, or are they allocated centrally? Okay. Art, music, and phys ed are these okay, areas that Okay, so I'm just picking up where things are, Look, are anomalous. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, those were my main uh, lower level questions. My bigger level <coughs> thing is I continue to be very concerned about the decrease in the inclusion TAs to offset the team-based changes um, to the team-based model. And I would like to hear more about how teacher, I'm concerned about manpower in the classroom with all the kids as, as they're moved into the classrooms in a bigger inclusion model. Um, and I'm not saying this is something, this would be something I'd like to hear more about uh, on 
the 28th. Okay. We spent a lot of time, I, I worked very closely with Kathleen Lockyer, Chris Carlson, Ben Halfat. Uh, there was a lot of very thoughtful work that was done person by person thinking about how this would play out. So this was not done haphazardly, it was very targeted. I'm not questioning that, I just, when I think of what it's going to look like to the, all the children in the classroom, I'm worried there's going to be instances where there is not as much manpower in that classroom for handling the needs of all the children. And I'm, I'm just, and I've run it by some special ed parents and that, and they agree with my gestalt thing, but I'm not saying I'm an expert, I'm just, I'm concerned and would like to hear more about that. Um. Actually, it's really a shifting. Even if you think about actual number of people, the number of people really haven't changed that much. Um, say we have five inclusion TAs at a building with one learning specialist. Well, we're still gonna have two inclusion TAs and a building TA, but we're increasing a licensed learning specialist at that school. So in terms of people, there's not a big change, but there is a really large change in terms of expertise. And additionally, we've also, by going to the building-based model, they have half a team chair and half a psychologist who are in the building in a way that was not previously so. So they too provide support to the students in the teaching and all the elementary schools will now have a full-time social worker who is providing support to all the, the people. I'm, so the model of the TAs goes back to the time when we had none of those people housed in the building. And now we have all of these people housed in the building. Right, I'm just thinking they're not housed in the classroom. Anyway, Mr. Hanner. Would it be possible, Kathy, to give us a, a diagram of how the building is set up with, with instructional bodies and how, how sort of a diagram of how it's going to be serviced. Yeah. It'll make it a little clearer to me. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Have, oh, Mr. Hanner. Oh, sorry, no, Ms. No, Heim. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was, I think this, in interpreting that, um, it kind of comes to what your knowledge is in terms of different ways of administering special ed services as well. And I'm wondering, since you know, I saw that there were some behavior um, specialists also put in place elsewhere in the budget, and so, you know, for me, I I was thinking, oh, there's a redistribution of getting more specialization in, but I think it would be helpful if um, Dr. Lockyer could give us the primer on where the model's going mm -hmm. as we get that budget piece, so that it's a little bit clearer to everybody how there actually is going to be very significant specialized work with certain students as opposed to um, more generalists just being there to maintain. Right. Um, I'd be happy to do this and she's, she would also be happy to come on the 28th. Um, in a very broad idea of this, and I think the, doing the chart will be helpful because it's great visual. The philosophy of what's happening is that we're doing more into the classroom than we've ever done before, whether it's speech and language or support services, and it is fueled by the research. The research out of Harvard Ed School is that it's incontrovertible at this point that students do achieve more when they are in the least restrictive environment in, in, a, in an inclusion classroom. What has been the practice is doing more pullouts out of the regular curriculum and getting some support. And I'm not saying that support's not helpful, it is. But on the other hand, the student is now out of the classroom instead of in the classroom. It's not as though there's dead time in a regular day. The math goes on, the literacy goes on, the science, and so if you take a child out, they're missing that curriculum. So. We are moving toward a much more inclusive um, environment with a lot more support to teachers and a lot more and more support for students that is has more expertise with it. But I think um, she talked about this, but I think it's an idea that uh, the the clarity comes more with the more you hear about it and ask questions as, as our own understanding evolves. But I think 
your suggestion of a chart will be very helpful. Um, and even the same thing with speech and language, it's getting more into the classroom and not having a clinical model of a pullout. And uh, I, I, when we are, let's go back even a couple more steps in this. When we're looking at our achievement gap, we see a persistence. And so you look at it and say, all right, well, there are lots of different things that we can do, differentiation and so forth, and professional development for our teachers. But to not think about how we structure the day and how we structure support services would be, would be sort of actually, I think, a little irresponsible in terms of not thinking of some of the structural issues that might, be, might change this. And uh, as, as Diane said, it's very thoughtful. It's looking at the research. And so we are really not only increasing our support for teachers, but we are really changing a structure which I think will, we will, th this is what we're investing in and hoping we will see is a major change in student achievement over the next few years. Ms. Heim. Just to follow up though, as the primer from Dr. Lockyer, going with that push in model for her to actually identify where the positions that are the push in positions mm -hmm. are and show that as a balance and and give us that that piece of these are going to be spent this translates into this child gain <coughs> very specific service for this amount of time helps with the understanding of the budget and those position yeah. movements. I'll ask you to do that. Now, I also want to say, it doesn't mean that we're not ever having any pullouts. That's not the case. But we're, change, we're shifting to a much more push-in model. Yeah. And just to clarify, I'm not saying it's a inferior model mm -hmm. in any way. I'm just concerned that there are some children who sometimes need additional one-on-one -on -one support. Just they need someone working with them to do what they're trying to get done and I can't see I understand there's going to be specialists in there working with them some of the times but I just don't see that there's going to be someone in there a whole bunch of the time if think of it this way too if you have uh, 18 classrooms and you have five inclusion TAs we don't have someone that's in every classroom every minute of the day we just don't um, so we're looking at how, how to be more strategic uh, about how we use our resources. And um, if we were to have somebody, an additional teacher, a uh, TA in every classroom, in our, our budget would go through the roof in terms of support. That's not, that's not how, how we're doing it even now. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have some students with one-to-one. -one. We do, but that's... That those assignments come through an IEP process, and there's really very um, good reasons why that would support would be there. Okay, Mr. Thiel, I'm, I'm going to presume that you're going to monitor this carefully. Oh yes. And that if this, if there are issues, you're going to find a way to, to address it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Hainer. Okay to go on. Yes. Okay. Page 54. Uh, uh, it's object description 81117. I got Under excited what, what about. What program? Pardon me? What program? Uh, program uh, school committee, 6900. Up oh, at the top. Oh, what of the did page. I do there? That's well, I got it all excited. I thought we got it, we're going into pay that because. That is obviously a snafu on my part. Oh, jeez. It says 239000 for other salaries good and good wages. Catch. That is clearly a snafu. Ooh. Good for we, you, uh, Bill. What's, that, what's that number divided by seven? I, yeah, I mean, it's thirty thousand dollars. We said we were. I'm sorry, everyone. Got all excited yeah, about sure that. It is. It is. It is actually transportation money. It is just. Well, in the, it I, is in the wrong program code. I apologize. Well, I, fine, but I mean, <laughs> okay. So that it isn't two hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars for us. It is, but it's not for you. Yeah, it, it, but it doesn't come. It doesn't belong to the school committee. It's it's the bus drivers. It's meant right. It doesn't belong under the school committee. It does not. Thank it you. It is a program okay. error there. So Bill finally got one. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm impressed. Sorry, you folks. Went, you win the gold-plated magnifying I thought, glass. I, I thought we were going to start being in line with Cambridge or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Better. Okay. Any more? I'm set for okay, tab Okay. Well, that was a great one to take us home <laughs> with. Uh, section 9. <laughs> Mr. Hanner. On page 23. Um, under Superintendent uh, 6910, it says uh, teacher salary and wages for $29,000. Uh, 
Is our superintendent doing something on the side? No, no, that, that is a staff position that's been in the superintendent's budget for a long time. Uh, well, actually it hasn't been in the budget. The, the teacher is the, now which one am I looking at? Make sure uh, I get 81112. Yeah, yeah, uh, under, under the superintendent, 6910. Right. And it says if you'll look at the description, it's the uh, AEA union reps portion of the salary. And we keep that under the superintendents? Yes. I mean, you could put it anywhere you want. It just seems like a logical place for me because I know to look well, for it there. I mean, and it, half of it, it is offset by the AEA itself. No, I understand that, I understand that part. Mm -hmm. But I just recommend that we put it somewhere else. Where would you recommend we put it? I don't know. But it, it looks like the, 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 the teacher, I don't know. At first I thought there was a teacher in the room. And then I thought maybe Kathy's teaching on the side somewhere. And then I knew that none of that was there. So it, if I had time, it would be okay. great. Yeah, any, further, <laughs> any further questions? No, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Just for the record, I'm fine with having, it makes sense for me to have it there because it's a yeah. cost of our doing business. Yeah. Um, it's a contractual obligation district-wide. Uh, it's really one that, that we encountered, so it might be under school committee, but it's, it's yeah. Yeah, it, it, in either. this neighborhood is the right place for yeah. it. And yeah. I, I'm not going to argue it. Okay. Section 10. Mm -hmm. Any questions about Section 10? Section 11? Oh. Question. Mr. Hainer. Just a general question. Do we get money from the state for transport, transportation for homeless? It goes into the town coffers they would not come directly to us so that whole lawsuit to help schools yep. and we it don't is helping schools because everything that goes to the town goes to the bottom line of free cash and extends the multi-year plan and funds us for it's many, just an, for it's a roundabout years. way it doesn't come directly to us okay just before we go yes. on to um on <coughs> under section 10 um could you just describe again the the reductions in in the schools budget details for um, special ed you see all oh the yeah those are those are the 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 teaching assistants coming out predominantly in some teaching positions you can tell whether they're teaching assistants or teachers by whether if they're in 81116 mm -hmm. they're teaching assistants if they're in 81112 they're teachers but it the really the easier place i mean this just details what what schools they're coming out of More questions? Okay, moving on. Section 11. No questions. Going once, going twice. Section 12, and that should not have questions in it. Okay. I just an overall question. Oh, Mr. So Thielman. <laughs> the, as I hear you go through the budget, you're using conservative uh, revenue projections. That's certainly wise. You're anticipating an 8% reduction in uh, grant money. That's what, $200,000, something like that, roughly. We're in February, the fiscal year, our fiscal year ends, the current fiscal year ends in June. The new fiscal year starts on July 1. So we could get new information. We will get new information. We will get new information in the next three, four, five months. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm expecting that you're gonna come back to us and say, maybe, Good news, maybe we have $200,000 more and you're gonna ask us or tell us, uh, give us some ideas how you wanna spend that money, is that? I'm hopeful, point? and particularly with the special ed grant, which is our largest grant, um, that the 8% will not happen. They've been gently increasing us over the last several years, so I'm quite hopeful that that, that will be the case in this year too, but I don't wanna to commit to it at this point. Okay, so I guess the one, one thing I just, the one kind of reminder I wanna put out there is that it's quite possible this is, this is, it's possible that this is a little too conservative. We'll have a better idea in May or June or April and- Maybe not till August, unfortunately. Okay, but even when that occurs, that's a, that could be a chance to hire some additional people. It could yes. be a chance to put additional uh, bodies in the classroom. It could yes. be a chance to hire additional TAs, lots of different things. Correct. So I think as that occurs, we need to be kept informed mm -hmm. and we need to have some discussions at this table or at subcommittee about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so if you'll recall through the fall, I would bring you updated yep. funding summaries as these changes would take place, as we found out what circuit breaker would be and all of that, I would bring those to you. And often in the summer, there is an if, if new money is available, we have an opportunity to hire some people. Mm -hmm. Certainly July and August is the time when we do that. Yeah. 
Just, Mr. Schlickman, did you have something or? Yeah, I, I just, I, you know, I, I think that in, in part in going through the budget and, uh, and critiquing the graphs and stuff, it sounds like we're engaging in criticism. And I just wanted to say on the other side, this is a very thorough and thoughtful document, and there's a lot of work that went into this, and it's well organized. Uh, and I'm very appreciative of the efforts to do this. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't want the session to expire without making it clear that I'm very appreciative of what I have before me, e even though you know I'm thinking critically about what's going to happen to us when we end up at town meeting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh, Yes, this is, a, this is just a road map, mm -hmm. and, and things can change uh, in lots of different ways. And I know that you're all aware of things that we haven't been able to fund. Mm -hmm. We've identified what we can of that long list. And it, it could even be that um, as we go along, some of the other things change in their priority. So I think that's something we need to have a discussion about. I'm very hopeful that we actually will have additional money. Mm -hmm. That would be terrific. Um, and we'll also have a better idea where we are with enrollments and how many students actually are coming to us for kindergarten, what that looks like with classroom sizes. Because right now, uh, this budget assumes the same number of kindergarten classrooms as we currently have. Um, and I'm, I don't know if that will change. So we'll look at all of that and we'll, maybe we, at the budget subcommittee we'll bring some of our suggestions and, and have this discussion of what we could do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer. I hate to talk doom, but uh, the potential sequestering that might take place, mm -hmm. will that have any direct effect on us in, that we need to be considering in the near future, or would it be down for next year? Well, that's why we went with the 8%. Yeah. Okay. So we were trying to cover but against that. We won't see an immediate impact on it today. This year, this yeah. fiscal year? Oh, not this fiscal year, no. It, Thank you. It was discussed at Long Range Plan, not this time, but last okay. time, and there was not felt to be a big impact. Okay. And nothing that we're, that's affecting us from the town. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Ms. Yes, please. <laughs> Ms. Hanson. So I actually want to go back to the green sheet for a minute on the infrastructure support. And I'm just wondering about this one and a half vacant custodial positions. Where are those vacancies currently? At the high school. And is there currently a night supervisor? No. And when was the last time there was one? Do you I don't know? know that there has ever been one. Mm -mm. And does a night supervisor do the cleaning as well? or? The night supervisor will be um, providing support to the people that work the second shift will be there um, to direct, to manage, to facilitate. What, the, what we're really hoping to do with this shift is that um, traditionally the custodial supervisor has been housed here at the high school. What, we're, what our plan is is that the day custodial supervisor will be housed at the Audison, the night custodial supervisor will be housed here at the high school. By having a supervisor permanently positioned up at the Audison, they'll be in a position to uh, monitor the subcontract that works every night to clean. So that gives them an opportunity to provide management. Even though they're not on shift with the, the night cleaning crew, they're walking in top of the morning every day. They're going to see what did and didn't get done and will certainly be on top of those contractors to make sure that gets done. One of the, you know, when you, when you sub out cleaning, one of the things I've heard over and over through my professional organization is that you must manage them. You must be on them. You need to have people on your staff who manage the subcontractors. And we had hoped to do that when we added the subcontractor at the Audison and it just didn't work out. And this is an opportunity to make that happen. I think we'll have a cleaner Audison. We'll get more value out of our subcontract by having a manager on site predominantly every day. And by having a night cleaning, a night custodial supervisor, I think we're going to get a cleaner, more efficiently, or a more efficiently clean building here at the high school because that's been a struggle. And so that's what we're really hoping that with this additional management support, that things are really going to be better. Okay, I'm asking about it also related to kind of the heating issues that they've had here at the high school and not have and lack of plumbing people and other people. So just kind of 
this all fits together somehow? Well, they're, they're really different issues. We have quite a number of custodian, well, we have some custodians and maintenance people that have been out on comp for quite a while. And, and in fact, that is the case with our staff plumber at the moment. <coughs> and, you know, we would prefer to hire a new plumber, but we can't because they're out on comp and that, that's where things get really kind of dicey. We end up spending a lot of money to outsource the work it doesn't work as well when we don't have people on staff. Our plan is to fully staff all those maintenance positions that are still in the budget, but some of them are sitting there not filled because the person who owns the position is on comp. Mm -hmm. okay. And would it be under Section 7 where the Xerox machine budget line is? Actually not, because that is largely funded by the capital budget. So town side? It would be, it, the portion, uh, uh, the bigger portion, about two thirds, maybe a little more, of the um, the photocopier maintenance lease agreement mm -hmm. is on, in the capital budget, mm -hmm. and the rest of it is in um, the business office under equipment rental. That's the other piece of the photocopier lease. So, which section would that be under? Um, you can look. Uh, that would be cost center um, 66, I believe. Under which, uh, so seven? So if you go to center. section oh, no, um, eight and you go to cost center 66, let me find the page for you. Um, 49. Yep, it is page 49 of 56. And under equipment rental, 82703. You'll notice that there's quite a bump up from FY13 because we are going into a new lease agreement. And I know that we are deficient in machines in some of the locations around the district. And so I'm anticipating to have to, uh, I'm anticipating to obviously have to spend more in the new contract for the photocopiers. So page 49 of 56, you yes. said, and which line? It's um, equipment rental, 82703. Mm -hmm. okay. And then there was another line item for um, printing cartridges and well, things like that. There's printing, which is when you send things out like but this. toner and... Toner, paper toner and ink. Right, is, was a separate line. Correct. Is, is that also in here somewhere? Right, but th that would just be paper toner and ink for the business office sixth floor. That's not for the whole district. So that big number of like 100,000? Is for the whole district. That's everybody's paper toner and ink. And that's in this? It's on? Index section or a different no, one? No, it's in seven. Seven, and that's what I thought right. I saw. Yeah. And and it's that's on, where you'd see it aggregated. And it's on page But uh, if you look at equipment rental in aggregation, that also includes some equipment rental we do for facilities. So that would kind of blur that number. That's not just photocopiers. Because this yeah, is another item that I know that we're looking at, and it's important going forward with the new evaluation system, and it's also important just with the day in and day out running of the schools right now. Absolutely. Okay. All set? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, I think at this point we will move on. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Um, so we now go on to the update on the Thompson. Well... I don't, I don't know if you've had a chance to drive by. It, it's, it's really looking, every time that I do, I can see major changes. Uh, one, one of our concerns, of course, was the, the deep snow and how that was going to affect things because uh, would, that slow, would that slow the work down? And I did receive an email just the other day that, that uh, th things were protected and um, they've clearing the snow and pretty much back to work on it. So it slowed things down, uh, but we are doing well in terms of a timeline. And we've, we, the build, Thompson Building Committee continues to meet uh, once a month and um, has an up, our, our project manager has a, a, a monthly updated schedule and we still are looking at actually even being 
able to have deliveries of furniture and start even moving some of our technology in, in um, July. I think that's a possibility, though, we've, we'll, we'll be, when we send it out to bid, it'll be for early August. So in that area, with um, furniture and that all is going to go out to bid in the next couple of weeks. And with allowing a very generous 16 weeks for delivery, so we will have things that will be ready to be delivered in, in um, July. Same thing with technology. All of those bid documents are being prepared right now, and that will go out to bid as well. So we're, we're in good shape in that respect. We are opening a little earlier than we have in past years this year. Our we, teacher days are the last week of August, but we don't anticipate um, any issues. Um, our contractor and our, build, and our project manager understand that teachers like to get in the building and get the room set up. And so we want to make sure that that's the case in August so that teachers can get in there and do that. All of the furniture and the materials will be delivered directly to their rooms. And then we also have um, great success that's been going with the Books for Bill. We've met, met the target. In fact, we're going over the target, which is fantastic because uh, there'll be a committee that will be organized to think about um, sort of long, long range supplies for Thompson that relate to library services and, and, and perhaps media more general, but that committee hasn't met yet. Uh, they will meet so that even though there will be materials that will be bought for the opening of school, we'll be able to have a fund there that can keep updates going. So that's, that's terrific, and I believe that the, we're in the process right now. I don't know if it's been set yet. It's been allowed back and forth on a, on a date in May for a community event for the, the Books for Bill uh, fundraising. So it's, it's going along quite well. Um, at town meeting, we will plan to have the boards out there, which will give a picture of what the rendition is and also uh, some interior, which you've seen. And actually, I was thinking it might be good to even try to get this up on our website, too, so people can click into taking a look at that. So we'll be doing, trying, to, trying to do that as well. They've started painting on the third floor. That's always a good sign. Mm -hmm. So it's going along quite well. And it's, besides being on time, it's going to be on budget. Our contingent, <laughs> this is important. Oh, yeah. Our budget is, uh, still has a, a, a very um, good contingency fund in case something happens. But we're now past the point where we anticipate big, big ticket items on contingency at this. And all the windows are here. That was one of the big issues. Um, because of the storms down in North Carolina, that's where they were being manufactured, where they're going to be a big delay, and now I think they're all on site. Great. Many in. Okay. okay. And now we move, thank you, uh, superintendent report. Back to my notes. Well, the first thing that I want to report, though I believe that, that all of you are aware of this, and as well as the Hardy community, um, it was with much sadness that I accepted the letter from Deb D'Amico, who is the principal of Hardy Elementary, notifying me that she was going to retire at the end of June. And uh, I, I say that truly that will be a very, uh, we're both happy for her because she's certainly had a lifetime of dedicating herself to the education of children. And she has just done an exemplary job here in Arlington. And she will be missed not only by her, her school and her parents, they, they took the news quite hard, in fact, uh, but she will certainly be missed by all, the whole administrative team because she's such a, a, a valued member of it. And you've heard her presentations here. She's just eloquent and thoughtful um, on on just about every topic in education. So it's really uh, a sad thing for all of us, but a very happy thing that, um, that she was here for the years that she was. And um, we've certainly benefited from that. 
So going forward, we will be doing a search. Um, we actually just got this week uh, it posted. And um, I will be meeting with the parents and the staff uh, um, in March, or probably I'll set up some, some times where we have a forum and talk about what they would be looking for in, in a principal. And we'll be setting up a, a screening committee. So all of those things, that information will be forthcoming um, after vacation, and we're moving forward. So with respect to the other searches, um, thank you to the members of the committee that met today with one of our special education candidates. We've had, it's been a particularly crazy last week and a half in the Arlington Public Schools, especially on this floor in this building because we've had four finalists for the Arlington High School position, principal position, which has involved um, four all day visits that included meetings with different groups, including the principal, the administrative team, special education coordinators, teachers, um, staff people, students, and, and we had two parent evenings this week and uh, to meet, we had two candidates each of those nights. So in all of these um, groups, I've been getting feedback forms, which I will take under consideration and been doing a fair amount of phone calling also, of references. We were very fortunate to have four strong, very qualified candidates um, that each would be um, an asset to our school system. So it will be a difficult choice as we move forward. We have now completed today the last of those visits. But along with those visits, we've also had two finalists for special education, and those visits have been concurrent um, through the district. And they have involved tours of the different programs we had, meeting with special education coordinators, administrators, teachers, We're trying to have as much um, exposure to our candidates to have the feedback that will help make, uh, make a decision. So it's a, it's a um, we've made a real effort to include as many of the stakeholders in this process as possible, and um, I expect to have a decision on Director of Special Ed uh, fairly soon, as well as the principal. That, that decision probably will not be announced until for, for the principal until next week sometime. I still have some, um, some work to be done on that. Uh, for Director of Special Ed, probably the same or, or possibly tomorrow, but more likely uh, next week. So, yeah. Just for clarification, on the Special Ed Director, you'll be bringing a name to us, correct? Yes, thank you. The process is, for special education, um, that is your duty under the, under the reg state regulations to actually make the appointment of Director of Special <coughs> Education is one of the positions you do. So when I say a decision would be, it'd be my recommendation that will come to you. I had actually hoped to have a recommendation tonight, but the snow threw everything off. Just uh, my three of us this afternoon left before we had a chance to fill out any uh, the form like we did for the prior yeah. spread because we were on our way down to the governance meeting. So I just wanted to let you know. Okay. Just email Dr. Bode. Uh, please, please do that. Um, I still have more phone calls to make. So I'm I mean, sure. I always say tomorrow is very ambitious. I just don't think that that's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but at least we had all of the visitations in uh, this week, and um, I, I'm fully aware of the fact that next week, with people on vacation, it's going to be hard to track down everybody. So tomorrow will be a heavy day of trying to do that. So no, and, and what we'll do is, is, as we had planned to tonight is to put the uh, interview with the candidate for director of special education here uh, first on the agenda on the 28th. Now I realize we have a hearing, so we'll have to think about. Oh, It'll have to be after, after the, the hearing. hearing. Well, a hearing's time certain, right? A right. hearing's time certain. So you can have the hearing. You can have the that first and then a hearing as long as people are notified. Mm -hmm. That'll be up to the chair as to how she wants to do it. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, that's, it's been busy, but I think we're gonna have some good results on this. Um, snow. Uh, that's another thing that's rather been dominant the last, uh, last week. 
And I know I've had a lot of emails uh, from parents. And I do want to explain a little bit about last Friday. Because I have had a, a, several emails, but well, why did we not have school on Friday when we had only a couple of inches of snow? Uh, I seriously considered having a half day. But um, as we went through Thursday, it became um, clear in terms of directives from the governor as well as MEMA that they wanted cars off the road two hours before what they thought was going to be start to be the, the, the heavy part of the storm. And there was no, so there was really, when I thought about it, there was really no way to guarantee that we would have everybody home, buses back, and all of that and off the road by 12 and have a half day. So that was the reason in, in that respect. And on Monday, we, the, uh, depart we had a lot, of, a lot of conversations on Sunday um, about where things were. And I want to, at this point, compliment and thank the Department of Public Works and all of the people who worked so tirelessly. They did a fantastic job. They really did. In the amount of snow that we had and how much it was cleared, was it perfect with snow, snow piles? No. Where were we going to put the snow? Though if you look outside, you'll see a lot of the town snow. But um, now they did a great job, as did, as did our custodians. They were here shoveling and uh, doing what they could do. But we found on Sunday that the, those pickup trucks with plows, they were just no match for the parking lots. Just could not do it. And so we had to have front end loaders uh, at all of the places. And they, as I said, they did a terrific job. So we were back in, and, and um, as far as I know, there was absolutely no incidents. Everything went very smoothly uh, Tuesday morning. But I also know that some people were concerned about that, and, I did, and I, this is what I want to reiterate. I sent an email to all families um, Monday evening when I started to see these emails coming in. When we have storms like this, we try to make the best judgment that we can about the safety. Um, I'm in communication with Department of Public Works um, through some, sometimes the director and through our director of transportation. Our director of transportation and his surrogate right now goes around and looks at all of the roadways, particularly can a bus make a turn? And um, he looks very carefully at that. In fact, he had a list of turns that he didn't think you'd make and DPW came out and widened it so that we could make them. So that kind of work goes on, but sometimes parents feel it's still not safe. And I said to them, that is, that is something that you have to make that judgment about. And if you feel that you cannot get your child to school safely on a day where we have school, then all you need to do is to report the absence and say that you didn't feel it was safe, you couldn't get them there safely. And while we record the absence, uh, it is a valid reason. And that's important for people to know. Um, but they, people just need to know that sometimes the decisions are made also at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. We try, we try, in fact, we always get the information out before 6 in the morning because we have people that leave at 6 in the morning to drive here, and they need to know. So um, if you don't get a call by 6 on, on the alert now, you, we have school. So we have, so now to the last part of this. Um, we have one snow day left. Uh, we are now, our last day of school is June 27th. And our schools are not built for June weather in terms of really having, people work very hard at this, but it's hard having these really hot buildings. So we have one more snow day and I, and I do, I've talked to uh, my superintendent advisory group from represents teachers from all over the district, and we're going to look at a survey of staff just to see what some of the options might be and where their preference would be to be prepared. And um, we may do that right away. We will do that right away after vacation because one of the options might be to consider doing a half day on Good Friday. Um, it, at the very least, doing something like that might pull, the, pull our end date back a little bit. But this is, you know, we have a set calendar, so we're going we're gonna to look at what people have to put it out there as an option. If we wait to April to make the decision, the day is gone uh, because it's in late March. So that's something we're going to look at. 
But the alternatives will be, if we have another snow day, is that we, we have no, from what I know right now, there are no waivers. And so we have to do the 180 days. Putting an extra hour on a day doesn't count. It has to be a day. If you go past, um, you know, you go past your halfway point, it does count as a day. So if we did makeups, we probably would only do half day makeups. And we'll, so we'll, we'll probably need to, um, to get a, a sense of the community as to what they, what they prefer, uh, an April vacation day or a Saturday. There's not gonna be too many other options. Okay, Mr. Hayner. We were talking about it down at the conference in November, and one of the schools ended up having it, and they made it a uh, Hawaiian celebration day on a Saturday, uh, and everyone came in dressed that way in May on a Saturday. So, well, we'd have to put some fun yeah, into well, this. They, well, they we had, have to get, if we they, have to do it. They had a 90, 90 over ninety percent uh, 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 turnout with the kids, which was surprising for a Saturday in May. Mm -hmm. so. I'd go for before MCAS just to get a little extra. Whoa. <laughs> but anyway, we'll see. But, but that's out there, and I know some parents are aware of it, and I just want to acknowledge that that is the situation we're in. In your discussion with, Any? with, with the teachers, are you looking at possibly starting earlier next year? We are starting earlier next year. Um, we're the, on the thinking of calendar. Uh, I brought up preliminary one for you to, to take a look at, and. Um, Teacher days are going to be before Labor Day. School teacher students will come the Tuesday after Labor Day. That's when students come, except for kindergarten. Kindergarten is going to be the 9th of September, and that's because we have to do testing. And um, actually, one of the things that is in the budget we didn't talk about tonight, partly because we need to do an adoption. Uh, and I might as well mention that right now, because another reason for a kindergarten will start on the 9th. We have identified, uh, as you got a memo in your packet, that we've, we've taken a long time, very deliberative. We've asked all kindergarten teachers to visit uh, Tools of the Mind classrooms. Uh, we have had all principals do that. We've spent a t lot, many, many hours discussing this. And it is the unanimous recommendation of the elementary principals to do a full adoption of the tools of the mind. Uh, our alternatives are this. There's only a few things that we can do to maintain our accreditation. One would be to go back to the old system, and we'd have to start next year if we didn't make this decision, which is just paperwork. Just, just accumulating paper and paper and paper, and there's no professional development with it. But the every per Every kindergarten teacher who has been part of this pilot said they would not go back to the, to the way they taught before. So we, we're gonna go through a process, and Jeff and you and I will need to talk about how we'll schedule that um, piece of it, but we have identified money in grants, um, and again, should you not approve this curriculum adoption, then that money could be allocated in a different kind of way. But we wanted to make sure that we would be able to fund it going forward, and that's the time to do it right now. All right, um, just a couple other things. So I'll, I'll tell you more about Scholastic Awards. I don't have the, the list right now, but again, Scholastic Awards in Art is um, something that's run through the globe, and it's very prestigious and something that all Art teachers and art students really want to see how many awards you get, gold and silver keys, and we did very well. I, I can give you a, a full report later. So, well, you can look around. You know, we're, we're, we're preparing our students to doing really extraordinary work when they get to the high school program. But I also want to give you a report, and I, Laura printed it out for me, and where did I do with it? Um, <coughs> our, we. Carrie Dunn took um, a group of, I believe, 22 students to, um, here it is, here it is, to Model Congress. This is our third year of going. And this is um, held in Philadelphia. It uh, attracts over 800, school, uh, 800 students from all over the country, from very private and public schools as well. And they spend four days being going through a Model Congress um, um, program. 
so we had 22 students there, and in the end, 30 students out of the 800 are recognized with individual awards, and Arlington had three. So that was, that's really excellent. But I think what um, she was, uh, she talked in this email about how proud she was of just seeing them um, debate um, with toe-to-toe -to -toe with a lot of students from other uh, schools, again, nationwide, and how well they did. But what she was most proud about, or maybe equally proud, is at the, all the compliments I got about their comportment during deportment during the, the time period. People found them to be very well behaved. They had compliments from many from many <coughs> places. So it, I'm not surprised, but it continues how proud we are of our students and the work they do and the success that they get with their hard work. So congratulations to all of them. And it is now the article um, will be in one of the local papers soon. And, and hopefully you also saw the articles on our, China, our visit from China, uh, <coughs> delegation from China. And thank you to all of you who were hosts for that. I know you were. We had a good time. You had a good time. Excellent. It was fun. Yeah. Well, good. I, That's great. If I just might add, I was surprised, forgetful that traditionally they give a gift. Bonnie and I got some wonderful gifts. Of them. We were caught short, so she ran in the other room, gave them each a box of Girl Scout cookies, and we got an email back saying that they were the height of the back at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you for doing that. That's it. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, moving on, we have subcommittee reports. Uh, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Madam Chair. We had a meeting, uh, the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee, on February 12th, and we have four um, policies we'd like you to review tonight for first reading only. Uh, let me just jump right in. Uh, they're all health policies. Uh, we were guided and given a lot of advice and counsel from uh, nurse, uh, Head Nurse Lucille Nicholson, so I'd like to give her a lot of credit for coming up with these changes. They're bringing these uh, old, older policies really up to, up to code and up to, up to date with the current law. Physical examination of students uh, wasn't looked at by us since 2006. And essentially, there's, there, there is a lot of new material in this um, short policy. You'll see that um, there's a general physical exam. Um, it could be done by any licensed medical provider, not just the school doctor. Um, and there is a school doctor here in the Arlington Public Schools. Um, also new is you'll see the, the every student shall be screened in vision, hearing, postural screenings, and body mass index. That's a, that's a new item. Um, and that's, uh, that's all I have on that. Did, can I open it up for questions? Sure. Anything on that? Okay. Yeah. Moving on to uh, JLCD, immunization of students. Uh, also new if... Um, your child wasn't immunized. Um, essentially, um, the schools can exclude uh, the student from beginning, and we heard some of that today uh, in an earlier presentation. Um, there are situations, however, that there can be exemptions, uh, medical reasons or religious reasons. Uh, but if uh, there's any situations where there's uh, any communicable diseases present in a school, all susceptibles, including even those exempt, uh, are subject to exclusion. Yep. Um, I'm curious if McKinney Vento also needs to be um, recognized in the policy because if I remember correctly, um, if a child is homeless and for some reason does not have copies, we cannot exclude but, um, Dr. Bodie. We know the answer. We did talk about that. Didn't we bring that up, I think, a little bit? Um, and I'll have, to, I'll have to get back to you. There, there is um, the second to last paragraph, Leba, the, um, is in the case of homeless children, whereby they cannot be denied entry to school if they do not have their immunization oh, records. Oh, gosh, and I totally a, missed it. That Sorry. is a new section, I think. Okay. Um, the, I was looking on the old one. Thank you. Okay. Moving, moving on then. Um, JLCC, communicable diseases. Um, here we have... Um, doesn't say when it was last reviewed, but, but there is a lot of new additions on because of the 105 CMR language, um, which essentially the, the teachers shall report all children uh, with knowing signs and, and may give written notice to parents 
um, it's, it's often that the parents are contacted by telephone um, and each, each principal of every school has his or her own way of notifying um, the parents when, uh, when the child is showing signs. And um, the flu is not a communicable disease. That's what we, we learned in our discussions. Not considered to be a communicable disease. <laughs> All right, moving on to the last one, uh, administering medicines to students. Um, here it's basically just bringing it up, up, up to the state uh, current uh, guidelines of the Mass DPH uh, <coughs> under the administration of prescription medications in public and private schools and citing the Mass uh, Department of Board of Registration of Nursing Regulations. Um, really uh, just getting it up to date. And that's all. I, I, I suspect we'll have another meeting in, in, in the not so distant future to dis discuss uh, two other health related policies, first aid and accident reports. We did take those up in January and in our meeting uh, this past week, but there's some more work that needs to be done on both of, of those, but we'll be bringing those to your attention um, uh, very soon. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Quick question. I don't know if it's the policy committee or, or something the chair has to set. We need to come up with some guidelines for the superintendent's uh, evaluation, both the trial one and the other one, and look at timelines for this. Okay. Uh, Would the, does the policy committee want a formal motion, or does the policy committee hear that now it's time to work on it? It's time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And I think that'll be it's first up. Uh, push the policy. Yep. Um, Okay, anything else policy related? Nope, moving on, budget. We've heard lots from budget, any more? Nope. Community relations. Um, we have a tentative meeting scheduled for Thursday um, the 21st, um, pending the avail availability of the town hall hearing room um, for 5.30, um, at which point we will be discussing the district dashboard, um, the school calendar, for 2014, um, teacher conferences and s other school events, and um, that is all to report. Okay, curriculum. We met on Monday, February 4th, and discussed the AHS uh, program of studies book. And we're going to have we're trying to schedule two meetings in March. One between March four, prior to the March 28th meeting, which we're going to talk about formative assessments prior to the presentation of the full school committee. And then uh, Dr. Bodie has asked the committee to meet between March 28th and the first meeting in April uh, to review retail, the Rethink Equity and Teaching for English Language Learner course. Anything else that we wanted to talk about? And then thing, what you just mentioned. The thing I just mentioned? What did you just mention? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you just mentioned something else that we had to talk about. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the new um, elementary program for tools. Me, tools, tools of the mind. Thank you. We could, do it, we could do it though. <laughs> we, we all, we we all need to take it. We all need to take it. <laughs> I need to take it. Uh -huh. so when do you, what, when? So this would be between the 14th and the 28th, the first uh, meeting of the school? I think the first meeting. That way we okay. can yeah, start moving forward with it and, and come to a, maybe, okay. maybe the last meeting in March. Yeah, okay. So mm -hmm. two, three things coming up on our agenda. Look for a doodle. Mm -hmm. Boys. Okay. So you're addressing something that I had meant to bring up um, for retail. Um, is that something that needs to be addressed by the negotiating subcommittee because of the issues? This, this is the improving teaching and learning English of English right. learner language learners. And I don't even know what the retail cert, stands for. It's certification. Yeah, it's certification, and there may be some negotiation issues, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if we need to yeah. start that. Um, Mr. Hainer. I think before we start the negotiations, we need to find out exactly what we're going to have to, what we're going to be requiring the teachers to do. Once that's defined to us, I think then we could set up time to uh, some parts of it okay. may be within our prerogative without negotiation. Some parts of it absolutely would be mandatory to negotiate. I think that has to be made clear to us first. Okay. So I guess my question is, does it need to be 
sent to negotiations now or we're waiting for what curriculum says, Ms. Hyam? I'm wondering if it would make sense for Dr. Bodhi, um, Carla Br Bruzzi, and um, a representative from the AEA to actually meet and figure out the implications because um, my experience with it is that the district needs to provide certain PD, but it's a recertification issue, and and there may or may not be implications, but it seems like those three people together might be able to really figure that out. We, we have started. In fact, we've had more than one meeting on this. And um, yes, there, there, it, it, is a re, it is a certification issue. Um, and therefore, does it fall outside of negotiations? There's certainly legal opinions to that effect, but it, it is also a substantial uh, professional development, and that's something that we talked about. Um, it, but it also figures into our plans for how we're going to organize classrooms in terms of compliance-bound SEI, because that. So, the it there are district needs that that. Um, are, are coincide with certification needs. And so the fact that there is both, I think that we've agreed that this is something we need to really talk about uh, in negotiation. But the reason for bringing it to the curriculum committees, I think that, that you, <clears throat> we need to educate you about what is going on in this area as we've gotten more clarity about it. and. Have a, and I think the community needs to understand this. So that's the reason we're going through this process. Okay, so you, you want yes. to go through curriculum first. We're gonna, right, and, okay. but we'll, we'll handle the negotiations. We're working on that piece as well. So okay. I think we were looking at maybe the, the last meeting in March. That's what we had talked about, to have the sort of a, a full discussion at the table here. All right, we'll set up. Is, a, is that we'll, what you we'll think? Okay, I just <clears throat> hadn't had a chance to straighten out what was happening next. Okay, facilities. I'm planning on setting up a meeting with uh, Dr. Bodhi to uh, develop an agenda for the facility committee, and I'll be sending out a doodle to that effect. Okay. Uh, legal services, I was not able to arrange a meeting in the past few weeks, and I will be contacting you for the next, uh, for the upcoming weeks. Um, and for chair, um, so in your packet, you have a synopsis that was sent from the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, f which met on February 1st. Uh, it's tucked into this. Given that you have the synopsis, I'm not going to go through everything, because um, it really nicely sums up everything that was discussed and I want to take partial credit because it was in discussions with Mr. Chapdelaine that I suggested or requested or something that we have something like this coming out of these meetings. And this is the second one that we've got. Um, and I find it very helpful and think it's a nice way of, Mr. Hainer. I'd like to congratulate you and them because I was very happy to see some actual, something in print uh, dealing with uh, the high school. Uh, and uh, it, it's yeah. in the future. But. So let me let me finish where we go with this. So so I'm not discussing everything that's right. in this. Um, the main thing that was discussed that was of interest to us. Well, there were many things of interest, but the main thing that I want to discuss tonight is the high school. Uh, the administrative team presented the same information that they had presented to us at our last meeting, enrollment projections and a discussion of the needs of the Audison felt not to be need rebuild and of the high school. Um, there wasn't additional information presented beyond that. The, it was mentioned that a statement of interest could be submitted by April 10th, 2013, which would mean that an answer from the MSBA would come in six to eight months and possibly pushing towards a debt exclusion in FY15 if the process was begun at this point. It was also mentioned that the uh, NASC report timing would be coming in the fall. Um, it was felt by the Long Range Planning Committee that it would be more prudent to build the case for the need for the rebuild in the community given the going forward 
um, the that a debt exclusion will eventually need to be considered if and when this comes up and to I next year for potential statement of interest submission. Um, so that's pretty much what it says here, but that's, that's what happened. Uh, we also had a BRTF meeting, which is budget revenue task force, which is when we meet with our state representatives, this, the board of selectmen, finance committee and other people. And I know several members were there uh, for the rest of you, it basically went over the same revenue projections that were mentioned here in the Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, it didn't even mention that. It mentions that the high school isn't considered in the projections, but it wasn't talked about specifically. There was discussion uh, by Representative Kaufman, um, who came just well, out of the kindness of his heart, um, and that if we are interested in supporting the governor's new budget with its revenue, the changes in the ways revenues will be achieved, that it would be helpful to work together with the Board of Selectmen in writing a letter. And they are writing the letter. Um, I guess we'll wait and see when it shows up and, and uh, see if I can sign it on your behalf. Um, but that was felt to be the most helpful. Oh, and we're also going to, in this letter, we're going to ask for a meeting with them. So the letter's being written to the Ways and Means Committee. I don't know, I'm forgetting, yeah. Mm -hmm. To the Ways and Means Committee. And um, so I'm waiting, they're, they're working on that. And they felt it was better just stick it all in one letter. We don't need to write our own letter. So that was BRTF. Um, and now we move on to consent agenda. Um, yeah, sure. um, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 13110 dated January 24th, 2013. Total warrant amount $585,094.36. Uh, Minutes for approval, none. Approval of Facing Racism Student Weekend Retreat, March 8th, 2013 through March 10th, 2013. Approval of Italy Trip, April 17th to, uh, through 24th, 2014 for all high school and community members. And approval of ELL Coach Job Description. Do I hear a motion? So move. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Um, and now we go into secretary's report. Okay. So communication. We received letters from the following. Um, a copy of a letter from Massachusetts Senator Kenneth Donnelly, 4th Middlesex District. A copy of a letter regarding um, retail update over year and next steps from Mitchell D. Chester, EDD, Commissioner of Elementary and Ed Secondary Education, dated August 27, 2012, to which Dr. Elsa Nampi referred earlier. Copy of letter to Mr. David Ardito from Dr. Kiersey Allison Ampey, Chair of the Arlington School Committee, dated January 25th, 2013. Copy of the memorandum regarding the annual measurable achievement objectives, AMAOs of, for English language learners from Mitchell D. Chester, EDD, Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education, dated January 30th, 2013. Copy of a letter from Patricia A. Plage, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name, um, dated February 5th, 2013. A copy of a letter regarding address changes, assessor's block plan number 38 and 39 lot from Vincent Kelly Commons, Engineering Division of the Department of Public Works, Town of Arlington, dated February 5th, 2013. Emails, Matt Coleman, happy news from Laura S. Chesson, EDD, Assistant Superintendent, Arlington Public Schools, dated February 4th, 2013. Condolences from Karen Tassoni, dated um, Tuesday, February 5th, 2013. Condolences from Anne Albertazzi, dated Tuesday, February 5th, 2013. Um, a forward 
2113 Long Range Planning Meeting Synopsis, Associated Ducks from Adam W. Chapelain, Town Manager of the Town of Arlington, dated February 6, 2013. Other documents, the Education Alert from Murphy, Hess, Toomey, and Lahane, LLP, dated January 2013. The Legislative Bulletin from Stephen J. Finnegan, Esquire, Massachusetts Association of School Committees, Inc., dated January 25, 2013. Arlington Public Schools announced a special education director's finalist from Kathleen Bodie, superintendent of Arlington Public Schools, dated January 30, 2013. Arlington Public Schools announces high school principal finalist from Kathleen Bodie, superintendent of Arlington Public Schools, dated February 5, 2013. And copy of letter um, from Leslie Sontag Krasnoff, dated January 17, 2013. Thank you. Thank you. And at this point, we um, will go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union or non-union personnel or to contract negotiations with union or non-union in which if, in, if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted um, and we will exit only for the purposes of adjournment. So um, Mr. Schlickman. Aye. 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 Um, we now go into executive session. Aye.